in public session, members. Mm. Okay, so we're now on item five, uh, and that is statutory rule uh, 2023 forward slash 131 teachers pension scheme remedial service regulations uh, Northern Ireland uh, 2023 uh, and the statutory rule is at page 96 in the packs we had a full briefing from <coughs> the department on that last week so uh, the question is are there any objections to the rule no not hearing any objections so that's agreed so the committee uh, considered statutory regulation, tra statutory regu rule 2023 forward slash 131, the teachers pension scheme remediable service regulations, Northern Ireland 2023, uh, and had no objection to the rule. Thank you. Okay, that moves us on to item six, uh, and that is statutory rule 2023 forward slash 122, curriculum circumstances in which a pupil may be excused from sexual and reproductive health and rights education regulations, Northern Ireland 2023 uh, and again the statutory rule is in your packs um, members the question is are there any objections to the rule just sure if we can put on note we we obviously re regret the decision of the secretary of state in relation to um rse um and you'll be aware that our party has always taken uh, in particular a pro-life stance Towards the issue of abortion and um, believes in the protection of the, um, and dignity of life, um, in that regard. Um, but I do think that um, that that a given that um, the issue of sort of year twelve and so on broadly aligns with the age of consent and um, an age whenever uh, pupils are trusted to make some of those decisions. Um, themselves by the law and therefore broadly aligns with that so I'm not objecting but I do want to put on uh, record our position on these issues. Okay. Yep, thank you David and that will be, be noted in, in, in the minutes. Um, yeah. Sorry I, ju I just wanted to come in and um, uh, similarly would like to put on note that I actually don't feel like this goes far enough um, uh, and um, would have uh, issues with kind of the, the, the <laughs> politics behind it. Um, but uh, appreciate that we are where we are, and it's the primary legislation, and um, that would would need uh, uh, would need changing. But um, I feel it's not progressive enough, so I just wanted to put that on there. Sure. Could I could I ask the member um, to, to elaborate on that? I'm interested. Why? What do you think? What do you think the problem is, and why you think it doesn't go far enough? I, I noted that your deputy leader had a, a position in regard to the wider abortion debate. They wanted to progress this too far, but, but but in terms of the, what do you mean by progressive? And why do you mean it doesn't go far enough? Chair, if, if if you're no, I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, yeah. if, I mean if, we'll, we'll come to whether there's formal objections or not, but I think it's quite appropriate to have, have this discussion, so happy to facilitate it. Yeah. So um, it's not actually in relation to the, the uh, piece around the abortion, although obviously it, my views I, I would be very different to um, some other members on, on the committee. Um, it's, it's actually about uh, the, uh, the ability to withdraw yourself. Um, from that. Uh, I think that relationship and sex education is crucial um, and I think having evidence-based access to information is so important and I would like every child um, to have that. So it's the, it's the withdrawing from that, um, uh, not making it available to every person that um, I feel is just uh, is not enough um, and I would like to see it across the board. Yes, fair enough. I, I welcome the, the, the piece of uh, legislation. I welcome the, the educational point that RSA will bring, but I do think it's interesting when we talk about parental choice in regard to types of schools and access to schools and stuff that there's an issue with this particular subject. I mean, parents and pupils will pick subjects based on what they want for themselves, and I think the right of the parent and the child to make an informed choice on any of these decisions is absolutely paramount. I think to make it ob obligatory would not be conducive for either young people or parental choice but thank you sure. thank you deputy chair yeah uh, I, I, I would agree with uh, kate in, in what she said there i mean we live in a society that has the highest rates of violence against women and children including sexual violence uh, it's on a par with romania i'm talking about in the whole of europe um we saw you know in the outcome of the the Ulster Rugby rape trial that received a lot of publicity and the Gillen review in the aftermath of that, that there is a need uh, for uh, a clearer uh, relationship on sexual uh, education, particularly around <coughs> issues like misogyny 
homophobia, transphobia, um, the whole issue of consent in relationships and so <coughs> on. Uh, so we welcome this piece of legislation as far as it goes uh, and we will be looking in the future uh, to tighten it up. That, that would be my view uh, at some stage in the future. Thank you. Just the I think that, that's fair enough. Uh, However, the, the, well. this piece of legislation was, was and, and the piece of work that was done by the department was around parental choice and, and access to abortion specific. The RSE stuff has already been there and I do agree that there's much more can be done, particularly in, around uh, violence against women. There's no doubt about that, but this is in particular about one element of the RSE curriculum. Thank you, sir. I'm conscious that we probably don't want to, to extend the conversation too far as, as, as we, we are meant to be specifically looking at, at formal objections to the statutory rule. I, I would make uh, one, one uh, comment uh, initially. And I think you know I agree with Deputy Chair and with uh, with, with Kate in that I, I don't think I think there are elements of, of the statute rule that don't go far enough. Um, I, I think there's not enough uh, consultation built in for pupils of all age cohorts. I think I think we need to be listening to young people on this. So I worry that there are there are young people going to be excluded from that opportunity to be consulted. Uh, and I also think that while I think there seems to be some agreement in the room about the need for good quality RSE across the board. If we allow opt out on certain aspects of it, it is all interconnected. Healthy relationships are connected to contraception, and uh, you know, sexual health is 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 connected to consent. All of these things are they, they don't exist in isolation. And if we opt children or young people out of some aspects of it, my concern would be that you're not getting a holistic curriculum, and you're not preparing children for the for the world that they they live in. That said, I mean, I think it might be be helpful if we and I'll, I'll, this might bring the conversation to to a close very conscious we're discussing legislation that was put in place when there was no assembly sitting so none of us have had the opportunity to scrutinize this yep. neither the statutory rule nor the legislation uh, that gave rise to it uh, and i'm also very conscious that there are a range of views across parties as already been you know very clearly articulated here and, <coughs> and a range of views probably across individual members as well because some of some of these matters don't necessarily always align just purely on party policy so given that context and given the fact that the legacy report from the previous committee was very clear that this is an issue that the, the committee might want to take forward, I, I would like to suggest, and we can pick it up at forward work planning, that maybe we, we agree from all of our different perspectives that we take a, a bit of a bit more detailed look at the issue of RSE policy. I don't want to say inquiry because I don't want to commit the, the, the committee to, to, to a very substantial piece of work in, in, in a shortened mandate, but maybe a mini inquiry, something that would be a policy focus to get a real sense where does RSE sit across the curriculum? Where do we sit in terms of other jurisdictions? Where do we sit in terms of that intersection of rights between the child or the young person's rights and the parents' rights? All of those issues, I think, would be good to, to get out to really consider in the round. So we can deal with it at forward work planning, but, but I, I would just want to put that on record. I think that might be a, a way through it to make sure the committee has the opportunity not to just sort of close this down and, and, and you know, to, to, to consider these issues in a bit more detail. I hope we can maybe get agreement on that. And also within that, clearly, about the, that, uh, that, that sort of uh, parental rights piece versus the, the, the child's rights, but also um, protections for teachers around um, them being put in the position mm -hmm. where they are being asked to teach something that maybe is completely out of line with their, their own personal beliefs and, and ethos as well. So just as part of that discussion. No, I'm, I'm very content that when discussing this issue, I mean, we, we need to hear from, from the broadest range of voices and, and, and views on this, so uh, we'll hopefully could take that forward in the weeks ahead. Yep. Okay. But to the, to, the, to the matter at hand, um, uh, the question is, are there any objections to the rule? Nope. Agreed. The committee considered uh, statutory <coughs> rule 2023-122, curriculum circumstances in which a pupil may be excused from sexual and reproductive health and rights education regulations Northern Ireland 2023, and had no objection to the rule. So that is item six uh, dealt with. So we're now uh, moving on and we're making good time, which will hopefully give us good time to- oh. Two out of five witnesses are here. Uh, right, okay, and for the department? For the department, guys? No, from the teaching council. But are the de departmental witnesses here? Flip it. No, no. Are they nearby, maybe? Are they nearby or anything? Okay. Would it, would it be helpful to deal with correspondence, perhaps, while we wait for the other witnesses? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. because I think some of the correspondence, in fact, may link in to, to, to some of the, 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 the witnesses attending. So, 
uh, with with members' permission, we'll, we'll we'll maybe skip to to item nine, given that we don't have all the the teaching council uh, representatives here, and we obviously want to give them all an opportunity to to speak. So we'll move to item nine. So I would refer members to pages one seventy eight to one ninety four. Uh, which details the correspondence received uh, to the committee uh, and a summary note of that is at item 9.1, uh, page 178. So I I'm going to highlight a number of items that, that I had drawn out that probably need a, a, a response from the committee. If any other members want to go <coughs> through those, either wish to, to suggest a different course of action or uh, any, any piece of correspondence that I haven't drawn out, very happy to, to hear. So. Um, Item 9.2 was a letter from the Chair of the All-Party Group on reducing harm related to gambling, uh, and it raises the issue of the Department's plans to bring in a statutory requirement for gambling education in line with drug education. Our members contend that the Committee writes to the Department to seek an update on that issue. Yeah. 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 If, if I could just, just a really brief comment uh -huh. on it. Um, I think it's something that, and Robbie, I'm sure will agree with me, um, as previous chair of that APG, like the work that has been done by that APG has been fantastic by Robbie and now by, by Philip McGuigan. Um, and, and I know he outlined it in his, his correspondence, but it, being on that APG and listening to the lived experiences of those guys, it's so clear that early intervention and education would, would play a key role. So if it's something that we can progress forward in this committee, you know, urgently and any other support we can lend it, I think we should be doing so. I would absolutely concur with those remarks. I think <coughs> in terms of a, an example of a really effective APG uh, here, I think that 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 one is is certainly going to be near the top mm -hmm. of the list. So they really have delivered some some really substantial and important policy work. Uh, it, it's definitely not your your standard talking shop. So I think credit is due there. So I mean, I would be of a mind that we we get correspondence away, and then on the back of that, we can certainly consider whether we we maybe need to do any more work and bring departmental officials in mm -hmm. on this issue. Uh, just one on that, if you don't mind, thanks um, to Cathy for for recognising the work of the APG, and, and, and Philip has hit the ground running um, in, in his chair uh, as of the APG. Um, <coughs> I would also probably suggest that um, the Department of Communities are responsible for the legislation, the second phase of the legislation, so I think it would be useful if at the earliest stage we also write to the Minister for Communities and ask for an update on where the second phase of the legislation is, because it's going to predominantly, hopefully, deal with the scourge of online gambling, which is much more pervasive and, and could wreak even more harm. So if that's if the committee's minded to do that uh, on a similar vein. Yep. Are our members content we write to both departments then on that basis? Yep. So we'll send it through yeah. the committee to the other department. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay, uh, item 9.3, uh, that's a letter from someone who may be familiar to former members of this committee, uh, Chris Little. We're an interest here, like. <laughs> Uh, but maybe I should formally declare an, an interest as a, a former employee of, of said correspondent, uh, Chris Little, uh, writing uh, from the IFA, and it's seeking an opportunity um, for the IFA and the GAA to present to the Education Committee on the withdrawal of funding for the school sports programme. And again, I'm just conscious that was an issue that was um, front and centre in the, in the legacy report <coughs> from the previous committee. Um, are our members content that we extend an invite to the IFA and GAA on this basis? Um, and I would suggest try and combine that with a briefing from the department on physical education in schools and, and we take it from there. Yeah, Members agreed? agreed? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, item 9.5, it's a letter from Farmers for Action seeking to present to committee on rural school closures. Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to take a view from, from members on this. Uh, I was going to propose that, that uh, we invite the group to present to committee and again try to maybe combine that with an evidence session from EA on area planning. Um, but if, if members feel that it's more suited to an informal stakeholder meeting, I'm happy to take views on that. But I, I would be of a mind, given the, the significance of area planning uh, and some of the recommendations in the independent review of education, I, 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 would, I would be content to propose that it, it comes to a, a, a formal setting of the committee. Yeah, I, I just Cara? just wholeheartedly agree with you. If we get if we could have them before us, I'd love that. I'm just mindful this is an issue not only in my own constituency of East Derry, but also my predecessors, uh, Daniel McCrossins and West Own. So any opportunity we have as a committee to meet them, I'd welcome. Sure. Great members, agreed. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> item 9.6, um, that's a letter from St Malachy's Youth Centre Belfast uh, and it's really regarding the range of funding pressures that are coming to bear on them and, and, and I think Clark had made me aware, Danny, you, you may want to come in on this, so look, I'll bring you in uh, to, to speak. Uh, to uh, it's okay, I'll raise it with the officials uh, when they just come in, I'm just, just reading through the letter, I'm just 
the detail of that there would have been the re-rating of the specifications when they went from 136 down to the 96 so almost made them part time um, and the difficulties they faced because it's like saying it's a cut that is a cut but what happened to the community and voluntary sector was the specifications got wider so it was like slicing the pie more so then collaborative work has to be incorporated into that and then the scene there not too long ago there was nearly further reductions in what specifications were going to go out there which makes it really difficult for the community and voluntary sector to deliver for our young people um, my concerns around it would be how EA is their collaborators their funders their assessors it's 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 not the right way to do business really in my opinion it's very hard for for the community and voluntary sector so it's about trying to get a better funding stream for them um, and just it's a bringing it back on par with the strategy um, bodies that we have out there because they do great work as well for young people it just depends on what, what say some communities will be heavily community and voluntary youth clubs compared to some that may be heavily strategy so it's about finding that balance for them so it's just, I can completely get what they're saying in that there because that, that was every youth club faced that and then there's a wee element within this as well for special educational needs you know specifications may have been written um, for it nowhere near enough might I add but where it came from was again a specification out of the community and voluntary sector you know so it's it's even more stress being put on them so I'll raise that with them the other if that's okay no nope, that's fine and th thank you Danny and from having had a, a briefing um, a party briefing we received from the Youth Work Alliance I mean I'd be aware some of these issues are in terms of the funding particularly for the, the community and voluntary sector in the youth sphere it, it, it's a highly complex system and it's very hard to get a handle on the budget so I think there's definitely a lot of questions to be asked there so obviously you're going to raise your, those issues um, directly but are, are members content that, that we go back to, to the youth Youth Centre and in, in writing to, to, to confirm that we've noted their concerns, confirm the content of anything discussed in relation to that in the, in the session, um, but, but also highlight for them that the, we have already, as of last week, identified youth service as a key priority and that we would be seeking a <coughs> briefing from, from the EA Youth Service and, and wider stakeholders in that regard. Members agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, item 9.7 <coughs> is an invite from Carrick Fergus Grammar to a research and education conference that they're hosting on the 28th of September. Um, again, happy to take a view if there are any members particularly keen to get to this, but I was uh, going to suggest that members were content that the committee responds to thank them for the invite uh, and, and the, to advise that's been circulated to all members to respond to uh, based on their own calendars and availability. Yes. Content with that, members? Okay, thank you. Uh, item 9.8, it's a contact from an individual highlighting the costs of the school transport system. Um, are members content that we uh, no, respond to the individual and advise that we're, we would write to the EA uh, and ask for uh, details of whether or not the current policy is, is under review? Yep, agreed. Robbie, do you want to Yeah, I'm just thinking, do we, do we write to the Minister? Because I know I haven't spoke to the, the, the directors and, and, and in the previous iteration of the, the, the committee here that they recognise that it's an old, archaic, draconian policy. Um, however, transport costs are <coughs> really, really, really high, and it would be easy for us when we want to, when, when constituents contact us, it, it, you want to see the change, but you also have to try and work pragmatically to say, well, where's the money going to come from? So I think it should be a ministry, one of the minister's priorities, I'm sure it is, but perhaps a, a something to the minister as well to ask, is it on his... Radar? Yeah, if, if, I, if I could respond on that, I think the transport policy, I mean, it's, it's highly complex, yes. uh, and I think... <coughs> Some of the recommendations in the independent review felt a little bit like a blunt instrument. Uh, we'll just charge for it, and that was that. Um, so I, I wonder whether if, if we are, in terms of forward work plan, and looking to bring the EA in, could, could we perhaps have that as a, a, a make that clear that we want to have a, a clear briefing and oversight on the on the, on the transport policy <coughs> where it sits? Would that be maybe would we potentially get more detail in, out of that than a ministerial communication? Well, it's just to see if it's on his radar, sorry, Chair. Uh, sure, and we, we, yeah, we'll, yeah. we can content we do both, yeah. then. is that, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and if I could just add in with that, um, we're seeing a lot of problems, and I know we'll be looking at newcomer um, children as well, but the children who are living in contingency accommodation in hotels, once they, they get moved into a house, um, and they will have settled in a school when they're in the hotel, they get moved into a house, and then uh, they're out of the catchment area, they can't afford to get to the school. So there are a lot of children who are out of school as a result of it, and transport is key to keeping them in the school with the friends that they have. So if we could ask for an update on what they're doing around um, that as well, it would be useful. 
Well, that, that's great. Look, it's a hugely complex, and I'm sure it's an area at constituency level we all get correspondence on because it, it's a really complex system to navigate for, for parents as well. Um, so are members content that we were going to send some correspondence to the minister to, to raise the, the issue as an area of concern um, policy-wise and, and seek a detailed briefing from the EA when, when they're before us, hopefully not before too long? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. So aside from that, th- those are the only specific bits of correspondence I drew out as needing a response and that everything else is, is to note. Um, so before we dispose of the item, can I check, were there any other items of correspondence that any other members wanted to raise, particularly requiring action? No. Okay, so are members content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary note at page 178 with the uh, exceptions of the items discussed? Yes. Is this agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, so Clark, where are we at with our? Uh, we now have four <coughs> out of five. With four um, out of five, the okay, union, okay. Uh, representatives, so we should maybe go to that. Yes, um, so we can move on to the to the Organic Teaching Council. That's okay. fine. So if you want to, to bring them in, that's great. Good, good afternoon uh, everybody and, and welcome to, to, to all of you who have attended today. Um, I'm not sure if, if Graham is on his way or can join us but we'll, 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 we'll make a start but thank you for, um, for, for giving us your time this afternoon, it's very much appreciated. Um, so uh, first of all just refer members to the briefing paper from the Northern Ireland Teaching Council and that's page three of table papers. Uh, and I would like to welcome, and you can all give your own introductions uh, in a moment, but uh, J- Jackie White, Mark McTaggart, uh, Maxine Murphy-Higgins, and Mark Langhammer, and, and we hope hope Graham uh, in due course. Um, so I was going to suggest at, at this stage to, 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 uh, to say 15 minutes as a, as a, as a, a timeline for, for presentations. Um, if it's less than that, that's, that's not an issue, but 15 minutes... Uh, given that there, there are a number of you presenting, um, just to make an opening statement and, pres- and make your presentation, uh, and then we'll follow that with questions uh, from members. So you're very welcome here this afternoon, and I will hand over to each of you to introduce yourselves uh, and to take it from there. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you. Um, and can I just thank the committee for having us here whenever you're, I know you're not very long established, um, and it's all it's quite exciting to see the structures up and running again, and we always found um, the Education Committee very helpful in the past, so we're glad to get the opportunity to share some of the, the issues with you. Um, maybe you'd like us to introduce ourselves before Mark do you want Yeah, to um, Mark Langhammer from the National Education Union. I'm Jackie White from the Ulster Teachers Union. I'm Mark McTaggart from the Irish National Teachers Organisation. <coughs> I'm Maxie Murphy-Higgins, the NAS UWT. And as, as you said, we provided um, a briefing paper for the committee. Um, I know that <coughs> you arranged to meet us quite quickly, so there are so many issues, as we know, across, right across the sector. So what we did was we focused in on some priorities okay. with the, the hope then that in the future we can work with you on, on some other issues. Um, so possibly with your indulgence, what we'll do is just deal with an issue each and you know give a bit of a, a framework and then we can move on from there. So do you want to? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with our biggest issue at the minute. As, as you're aware, we've been on industrial action since October 2022 on uh, teachers' pay. Um, and the reason, obviously, it's the last pay deal that we received was in 2020. And that was after three years of industrial action. Um, part of the pay, de- the pay deal was uh, staged over a number of years and uh, there were other parts to it in, involving um, reviews uh, in terms of workload and things like that across the board. There were, there were uh, 
nine reviews, eight of which have been completed, one of which still has to be completed. But the outworkings of those has yet to, has yet to come forward. Um, teachers' pay has reduced in real terms by over 25% since 2010. Um, the teachers', teachers take-home pay in relation to what it, it should be is hugely reduced. Um, and as I said, we haven't had a pay increase since 2020, uh, 2021. Since then, obviously, we have had um, the COVID crisis. And during the COVID crisis, while teachers weren't seen as key workers, had it not been for the teachers bringing children into school, the key workers couldn't have been, wouldn't have been able to do their job as effectively as they were allowed to. Teachers, in many cases, put themselves and their families lives at risk by doing it um, and during the COVID crisis not only were they coming into school they were also uh, ensuring that all of the children ha and school pupils had an opportunity to be taught uh, with either remotely or through social media outlets and things like that so they were, they, they very quickly <coughs> adapted to um, a new form of teaching um, without any Additional training and things like that. You know, it was it was teachers themselves who who uh, figured out how t children could continue to be taught. And in reality, when you look at the results uh, in terms of um, uh, tests and examinations, uh, to the best of their ability, that the the results didn't really um, fall dramatically. Uh, so it shows how much. How much the, <coughs> the teachers were there and working with the kids and ensuring the kids were educated. But in the last three years, obviously, teachers' uh, pay has stagnated completely. There has been no increase. Um, and in that time, across these islands, teachers here are now the least uh, paid teachers across the islands. Um, they're considerably less well paid than their, their colleagues in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and as a, in the paper points out, they're about 20, the starting salary for a teacher is about 24% less than the starting salary for a teacher in England. It's about 27% less than a teacher in, Scot in Wales, and it's about 33% less than a teacher in Scotland. And the issue that that has caused for the education system here is we are now going into a crisis of recruitment and retention, because um, while for a number of years before uh, COVID and before uh, there was such a disparity in pay, teachers were leaving these islands to go to Dubai or Qatar or Australia or wherever. Now all they have to do is get on a ferry and go to Scotland and they get a considerably larger, larger pay. Young teachers are coming out uh, of college with £40,000 in, in, in uh, student debt and um, they, can either, they can either go to Scotland England, Wales, or in the border counties especially, and um, they can just cross the border to go in and, and go and teach and, and get a considerably larger uh, pay, take home pay uh, through that. And it is a crisis because when our, our teachers or our principals are looking for um, supply teachers, the supply teachers aren't there, um, especially in the post primary sector where there are major gaps in specific subject areas for supply teachers. And even in full-time teacher teaching, uh, it's very difficult to get properly qualified teachers. They can get people who are qualified in, in the area, but they may not be quali properly qualified teachers to come in, which will definitely have a detrimental effect on the life chances of the young people that are are, are people what we are looking at and we're working with. Um, we do we do realise that um, for the last three years the money hasn't been available. But now the money is available, so there's no reason why uh, a pay deal can't be struck quite quickly. Um, obviously, we, 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 we have begun the negotiations around pay. We had our first pay meeting yesterday. We had a meeting with the Minister on last Tuesday. So those, those, those are moving in the, in the right direction. However, um, I don't see that our members will be willing to come off their industrial action for, for anything less. Than, than a proper uplift, which will, will reflect the worth again. We have an awful lot of teachers who have have been in the profession for a while, and they don't feel valued by by um, the those in power. They don't feel valued by the, the paymasters, um, and it's that it's that 
feeling lack of value, which is going to ha going to have to to be reflected in any pay rise as well. So that that's where we are in pay. We 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 have decided as an NITC that <coughs> while we have um, we had we had dates for for strike days in place, um, because we've gone into the negotiations, we aren't. Um, we're not going to call those strikes at this point. We will reserve the right to call them if the pay deal doesn't go the way we hope the pay deal will go. However, we have industrial action, short of strike action, which we will, our members will remain on until we get that sorted out as well. So um, that's where we are with pay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Mark. I'll just pick up then on, <coughs> on the next issue, and Mark has already um, referenced it, is the Workforce Review Project. Um, and it was part of the work uh, pay and workload agreement in 2020. Um, I've given a bit of background um, on the on the paper, but basically what happened was we had uh, members from um, members of working groups from management side, and we had members from the trade unions, and then we had an oversight group. I mean, I've, I've laid it out there for you. Um, we identified nine areas where reviews had to take place. Now, the reviews have followed through on eight of those areas with the statutory assessment, one sitting outside of that. And I know there is work going on there, but we, we haven't really directly contributed to that at, the, at this period in time. And the point of it was that in some areas it was to do with workforce, for example, improving the employment conditions for supply teachers, making sure that you, you, know, you weren't left on temporary contracts for a long period of time, that kind of thing exploring options for professional development by moving through the system, being able to move from one school to the other, those kinds of things. Um, so there were those sorts of workforce things, but then there were an awful lot of workload issues, which is, is a huge area. And um, it, it was some indication of the how seriously it was taken. I mean, it does say in the paper there that there were 197 joint meetings over a period of, of 18 months. There were 279 recommendations came out of those reviews and they were all recommendations that were pitched at improving the situation for teachers and therefore improving the situation for schools and for the children in those schools. And I've quoted there what the, the submission statement said, the end of this phase of the reviews and the significant work completed is a momentous step forward in striving to make a real difference to teachers' workloads and ability to focus on pupil learning and to bring about improvements to the effectiveness of our education system. And the point being made that that's what we're all looking for. So those were put in place. We've been working behind the scenes for, for eight, we, we were working for 18 months up until this was delivered. But due to the boundaries under which we were working, none of that information went out to the teachers. They accepted the pay rise at that time on the understanding that we were going to engage with management side in order to improve the workload. We now have travelled down the road. They have no idea what the recommendations are. They have seen none of them played out. There was no finance put behind them. And even those which were um, cost neutral, no, no additional cost, or something like that, they haven't even, they haven't gone into the system either. And we feel that that, Mark has been talking about the, the teachers not feeling valued. That has fundamentally damaged the trust that our teachers have in the process because they engaged in good faith. We used some of our members on those working groups, but for the most part, the vast majority of them don't know what came out of those, those uh, reviews. They don't know what the recommendations say. And all they know is here we are now, back where we started, looking for another pay deal, and we haven't actually delivered from the one um, in 2020. But one of the interesting things about it is that a lot of the things that we um, addressed in Action Short Strike are things which are, which are contained in those recommendations. And contrary to the belief of some, our Action Short Strike was never designed to impact negatively on the children. And our teachers would in fact tell you that the space was created for them to do teaching and learning and that the stuff that we took away around the outside was an awful lot of stuff which wasn't contractual in the first place but was also um, paperwork, uh, accountability things which look, we could spend ages going into where that came from and, uh, and work within the reviews has, has looked at rebalancing all of that. So a lot of the work, <coughs> if those recommendations had been put into place, we would see those having played through uh, played through already 
So we are seeking, um, as well as looking at our um, pay, as Mark has been talking about, we're looking at a framework, seeking a framework in conjunction with management side to put in place some sort of implementation process now. We did the reviews process. We want an implementation structure that we can start to feed these recommendations out into the schools and impact positively on the workload of the teachers, which in turn then frees those teachers up from you know, the, the superfluous stuff, if you like, around the outside to allow them to focus on the, on the teaching and learning. So we have we have raised that. I mean, the, we've raised that with management side, and we are seeking to move that forward. Maxine. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> what I want to talk to you about today is people and children and our, our teachers working in special educational needs. And as you, I'm sure you all appreciate that it provides a vital role. The special schools provide a, a vital role in providing educate and support to students with complex needs. These students require specialist support from teachers and wider staff to help them reach their full potential. And special schools are designed to provide the support in a safe and nurturing <coughs> environment. The tight financial constraints and the cuts of recent years ha have, have had serious impact on this. And I think that has been recognized in the recent independent review of education that was launched in December. They recommended an additional annual capital allocation <coughs> of 25 million above the current capital budget levels for an estimated period of five years to address the current needs in the provision of SEM facilities in both special and mainstream schools. Therefore, I think it has and it does recognise the underinvestment in our special educational needs sector. These financial cuts to our special needs has led to reduced staffing levels, increased workload and a more stressful work environment for teachers and staff members. The cuts have also led to a range of negative impacts on the students and the families who rely on these schools. If anybody knows anybody with a child who attends these schools, they know that they see it as respite as much as anything else. Um, and it, the reduced access to the special support, increased class sizes, makes it more difficult for teachers to provide individualised attention and support to students with complex needs. And the increasing need for the allied health professionals, whilst, there seems to be, whilst these seem to be reducing. Due to all of these impacts <coughs> of the cuts in SEN, there continues to be an unacceptable level of violence against teachers and support staff, uh, school support staff. In a recent survey of our members in special schools, almost 80% had experienced violence or physical abuse. It appears also when we talk around the Education Authority, it appears that the Education, <coughs> education Authority has not stabilised from it came into being in 2015. There have been numerous ch changes to try and cope with the increased number of children with special educational needs. They are trying to do more with the same. Reorganisation of the support services this year, referred to going forward as the local integrated teams, is due to take place in September, come into being in September 24, without any real scoping exercise or pilot in order to see how that's going to work. There are multiple reviews outstanding and in progress. We do not believe that children with SEM being placed in the mainstream schools are receiving the same levels of support as they would if they were placed in a special school. The issues for our teaching members specifically. Our special needs and teaching allowances are allocation is not clear and clarity is required as to who is receiving what allowances and who should be, should be receiving allowances due to the nature of the roles that the teachers carry out. Although it has been commented on that there has been damage due to our industrial action on children's education, it is, in fact, the cuts in education which are much more wide-ranging, which have had much more negative impact on our children's, ed children's experiences. Clear action needs to be taken in relation to our special needs sector to ensure our young people get the best chances in life. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, Chair, apologies. I was delayed by a few minutes. No, you're very welcome, Graham. So you all know that hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds have been taken away from school budgets from the actual point of delivery <coughs> of our education system where it impacts children and their outcomes in learning and teaching and safeguarding. Uh, it's so frustrating that schools are expected and rightly to deliver best practice, <coughs> but the truth is best practice is a bit of a pipe dream. It's an ambition that's barely achievable. In fact, good practice in the way schools are currently funded <coughs> is barely achievable. Schools are struggling to provide the bare minimum to children 
given how schools are currently funded. It's absolutely a disgrace that hundreds of millions of pounds have been taken away from our school budgets. Um, my view is, and I know it's shared by my colleagues here, if the system wanted to provide a service to our children, the system would surely first understand what is actually required to deliver <coughs> learning and teaching properly to our children. I cannot fathom why school leaders are not asked. You understand the profile of your school? You understand the needs of your children? What do you need to meet their needs? What do you need in terms of resourcing and staffing to meet the needs of the children in your care? Surely the system should then put that resource into the hands of school leaders and teachers to deliver what the children in front of them actually need. Surely school leaders should be asked, what do you need in terms of staffing? What do you need in terms of training to deliver what your children in front of you require? Instead, decisions about school funding are made by people in offices who are very far away from the point of delivery of education. In fact, many of them, it's true to say, the last time they were in schools was when they were in school themselves. It's shocking that this is how decisions are made. It's shocking that this is how decisions are made. And teachers and school leaders and everyone who are delivering for our children are sacrificing hugely of themselves and have been for very many years to keep our standards as high as they are. Uh, but I think we have to do a lot better. The, sy the, the system should turn around and face children and make decisions based on what our children actually need. Our schools are struggling to provide the bare minimum. First aid kits, soap, paper towels, basic classroom assistance, stationery, paper, paper. A lot of ICT equipment that has been purchased is now reaching its end of life. Schools can't replace it. This is, this is just the basic stuff. Keeping lights on, we have to do so, so much better. School funding, and, and by school funding, <coughs> we mean the money that is delivered directly to schools. Not money that goes into the system and disappears into a big black hole, but money that is in the hands of teachers to deliver learning and teaching and safeguarding to our children. That is what needs to be prioritised. You all know the figures. <coughs> you all know uh, the, the, vast, the figures are actually so vast now that they are barely comprehensible. They barely make sense. They're so huge. Uh, this is actually a crisis that's been developing for many, many years. It can't just be blamed on the crisis in this building for the last two years. This is something that has been developing for about 13 years. It has to be rectified and it's of the highest urgency that school funding is viewed with priority. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I've been, Mark Langhammer, NEU, I've been asked to say a few words on, on examinations. Um, I'm nearly 20 years in this job now, and <coughs> I think I would say that our system feels like it's very driven, very frenetic, um, very results driven, data driven, high stakes. Um, our teachers tell me that they feel both hyper accountable and micromanaged. So they're monitoring, assessing, evaluating, reporting, examining to access and all uh, to the detriment of what they feel they should be doing in terms of their professional autonomy, discretion and ability to, to, to judge. Um, there's an old farmer's adage that you can't fatten a pig by weighing it. So I think what I'm saying is we're doing too much weighing and not enough fattening. Um, just one of the ways that I mean, it might be strange for a, a union to be quoting the CBI, but we're actually in largely the same place, place as the CBI. The CBI have warned, and they're not wrong, that there is a danger of our schools becoming examination factories, and we would share that, that view. Uh, I mean, one of the effects of a sort of a, a narrow testing regime is that it prevents the sort of development of what some people call 21st century skills, some people call transversal skills, but I'm talking about the skills that are needed, not just in the modern, modern economy, but in the modern world, the skills of communication, the skills of persuasion, the skills of inquiry, the skills of independent researching, the skills of teamwork in research, all of which employers are telling us are, are lacking. Um, 
And what we could say back is, well, there's not a lot of room to do all that because we have a very rigid exam-driven rat wheel, if you want to put it that way. Um, the independent review of education, which for many of you are sort of Bengoa, uh, it, for instance, questioned the merits of the GCSE, for instance, and we would share that concern as a gatekeeper qualification. The GCSE was brought in in uh, 1988. Sir Ken Baker, now Lord Baker, brought it in. Uh, it was brought in as, a, as a, a, a terminal exam at a time when most of our children left school at 16. So at 16, that was sort of your passport into the world of work. So we could understand that. But that's not the case anymore. <coughs> Very few kids are leaving at 16. The independent review is actually trying to make it you know, uh, 18, the, the statutory age for leaving school or training or apprentices, apprenticeships. So we think, we think we should look at the GCSE uh, and the merits of it. Uh, that, could, that could be a very useful inquiry that this committee could take. Um, I don't say this belongs to all unions, but our union feel there's no merit in having a high stakes external exam um, <coughs> at that stage. Uh, so we should use that stage to do exactly the, the other things, the transversal skills, the 21st century skills, and so on. We sort of, in the upper secondary level, basically from the end of year 10, uh, that's, that's the end of third year in old money for those of my generation, <laughs> um, right up to the end of school at 18, it's non-stop exams. GCSEs, A-levels, you're on a, a sort of a rat wheel, and that's what we think we need to break down in some way. Um, we think we need more, in terms of curriculum, more vocational options, and not just vocational options, but vocational options of equal value. Yeah, I think we need more fluidity and collaboration between schools and further education. I think we should study the uh, transition year in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, that has been in for a generation or more. It has been thoroughly assessed and evaluated, and it is a quite successful programme for all who take part in it. Not everybody takes part. It is a voluntary thing. Um, but for for most of the, for the vast majority of the, of the children who go through transition year, the evidence is that they come out of it with a, with a much more mature idea of what they want from the education system. It's a much better idea of the of the, uh, the the directions that they want to travel. So I'm not saying we do that. I'm saying we should look at it. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, our exam system doesn't just squeeze time. There are a myriad of unintended negative consequences. When you have a laser focus on results, that distorts behaviour. Now, for those of you who have, you are probably very busy people, but uh, on the education committee, there's a, there's a book called uh, um, Education by Numbers. It's by a guy called Warwick Mansell, who for many years was the Times Educational Supplement Education Correspondent. He's now an individual consultant. Um, and his book, The Tyranny of Testing, looks at all the dodgy practices, all the corner cutting, all the joking the stats that people get up to to get the right results. All of the practices he lists, and his book is nearly 20 years old, <coughs> all of those practices are present in our Northern Ireland system. I was looking at it today. It's cost 350 on Amazon. It's not dear. Uh, you, should, you got a copy? You, you should invest in it. <laughs> I'll give you a free one, Robbie. You know? um, now, just a final thing, and I hesitate to raise this, but it, it's important. Um, we are concerned about real problems that exist currently within our, within our exam board, SIA. Uh, I am aware because we recruit in that sector and we represent quite a number of the middle and senior <coughs> managers. Um, five senior managers have left SIA in recent months. They haven't really left voluntarily, although we, they've all got better jobs. There is a big seepage of able, experienced <coughs> talent that's not easily replaceable in Northern Ireland. I believe 
they have left because there is a damage in culture and questions of governance that need answered in SIA. I can't be more explicit because all of this will play out in industrial tribunal. But put, put simply, we have a lot of business we need to do with SIA. How we handle artificial intelligence is but one of them. Mm -hmm. Very complex issues. Um, but we are concerned about the governance issues at SIA and we don't think they can wait for resolution in the courts. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just very quickly to finish off then, and it's back to governance, and it's the governance of our schools. Um, and and what, what's set out in the paper is the role of the governor and, and how the governor governors should work in school. And as I said in the, in the paper, for the most part, our governors, we know they're volunteers and we understand <coughs> the, the amount of additional work that they put in. And they are vital in our schools running properly and being there to, to have support the school and to challenge the school and things like that. Our concern is, in, in many cases, there are governors who are, are finding problems in schools, are finding problems from parents, and in a lot of cases they don't listen to the managing authorities. So, for example, when there are issues within the school which we would, we would be raising, where there are complaints against teachers or there are um, processes which have to be followed, because the governors don't listen to the um, employing authority, they don't follow the correct procedures. Okay, and that leads to, to major concerns for our members. It leads to major concerns for us because we go in. There's a procedure in front of us. We follow through the procedure. There are times times in the procedure which we have to meet. The governors ha are supposed to meet and don't always, which means these procedures can take an interminable amount of time. There's there's procedures in certain schools where which should really have taken three months, which are maybe into the second year. So there are issues with that. And there are issues then in terms of where um, governors, as I say, there are some schools where there are overzealous governors and who in, in their mind are there to run the school and to tell the principal what to do. I mean, what it says in the, the practice is the principal, they should be listening to the advice of the principal. They should be listening to the advice of the, the employing authorities, but in some cases they don't, and that causes major problems. And where a teacher or a, <coughs> a school leader wishes to complain about go the governor, or a governor or the chair of governors, the only avenue for them to do it is through TNC 2011-4 Annex 3, which is bullying and harassment by somebody who's not an employee of the school. And the issue with that is it's the police policing themselves in many cases because in that it's the governors who invest the governors investigate the governors and if you're not happy with the outcome it goes to the governors and the governors investigate your appeal and then that's it so there's no confidence in that and even where it's been demonstrated where a teach a principal has been bullied by a group of governors it's nearly impossible for those governors to be disciplined or to be removed and management said they ha there is there is uh, an opportunity to use um, and it's a, it's uh, it's under Article Twenty Three of the Education and Labour Board uh, Northern Ireland Order two thousand and three. Something needs to be put in place to protect both the governors, because there needs to be something in place that protects the governors, uh, where there are complaints made against them. But we need something which will protect our members. Where um, it has been demonstrated that uh, governors have been bullying either members of staff or school principals or school leaders. And in some cases, where, where governors are bullying governors, so that's 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 our that's us. All right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I th thank you to all of you. And look, I'm conscious that, that was much longer than the 15 minutes, but I think it was important. We actually heard all the issues, so I, I was, there was no sense that, that, that there was any need to, to shorten any of that. The committee were very clear in our first minute meeting that we wanted to hear from the teaching unions and that we wanted to do that as early as possible. So I am very pleased that we're, we're here week two, uh, able to hear from you. I think if, if this committee is not listening to what, what teachers are saying about the state of play is on the ground and what the big issues are, then we're, we're, we're not going to be able to carry out our functions. So I want to just say I hope this is the first of a, of a, of a number of engagements that we'll have over the, over the course of the mandate. Um, 
so um, there are a few members who need to leave early today, so I want to make sure we do leave time for our next uh, next uh, presentation as well. But I'm going to suggest that would it be helpful if we took questions just by those themes so that we're not jumping around. Um, so if we cover off pay and workforce and budgets, exams and assessment and governance, and there may not be questions necessarily on all of them, but we'll try and maybe keep our contributions sh short on each of those then to try and get through it. But I think it would be good to have a coherent discussion on, on each of the, the issues. So if we could maybe take pay and, and the workforce, uh, sorry, the, the workload review uh, aspect of things first, I just have a couple of very quick questions on that and then I'll, I'll hand back, back to members. Before I begin, I should just uh, declare an interest that my, my wife is a, a teacher in a, in a, a, a grant maintained integrated <coughs> primary school, so uh, uh, that's important to have that on the record. Uh, and given the last item you raised, I should also declare an interest that I'm a, a governor in, in a controlled primary school as well. So I wanted just to, I wanted to, to, to highlight uh, on the uh, the workload review project in particular, um, and I wanted to get a sense of because obviously we're into it, and I know that there may be elements of this that can't be discussed. There are live negotiations going on, so I'm very mindful of that. But in terms of the the, the pay negotiations and the, that are that are now live and thankfully are live, and there's some money on the table to hopefully get you know get progress through on that. To what extent is that workload review and those recommendations? A central plank of that uh, in terms of bringing a satisfactory resolution to to industrial action and action short of strike I, is it is it as critical as pay to the two are the two inseparable effectively i suppose i'm trying to establish well the the, the reviews are the outworkings of the last pd mm -hmm. okay so we 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 went into those in good faith expecting them to roll out following following the reviews taking place and, and uh, they were to go to TNC and they've never gone to the Teachers Negotiating Committee for thing. And as Jackie said, they've never been published. So our members, there is an issue, our members are going, look, you, you prom we were promised this before, you can't do that again. Okay. But in terms of, of where we are now, <coughs> what is the most critical thing for our members is the pay. And whatever money is available to the Minister to settle the pay dispute out of the, out of the uh, 296.8 million that he has to settle the pay dispute um, that's where our focus will be um, we need to, to get to a point where our our members are, are, are made an offer where they will feel valued and they will feel that they, they can move forward look we have we have young teachers who will never come into the profession we have young teachers who are being scooped up before they leave the training college. Our training colleges continue to to train people for export, but they're also leaving, they're getting their degree in teaching, and then they're being uh, siphoned off into other industries outside teaching too. So what we need is we need a, a pay which reflects the worth of the teacher and the worth of their degree, and that's where we are. You know, We can't continue to be sitting in a place where just by getting on a boat on a Monday, you can get 33% or 48% more pay. And when you, when you look at the paper, you can see the, how it, it actually, in terms of England and Wales, the, bo the bottom of the pay scale is a problem. In terms of Scotland, it's halfway up. You know, so th those are the issues that we have. So whatever, whatever we're negotiating now, we are negotiating on pay, and the pay is, for our members, the most important. I think if I could just, because then the flip side of the coin, that's the recruitment yeah. and then the retention, I think, is where these, the, the reviews come in yeah. because, and I mean, the, the, it's widely understood, I think, on all sides that we need to be rebalancing the profession. We need to be looking at what we're trying <coughs> to do, what we're trying to deliver, where we're going for each and every child. And I think this, what I mean, they're, they're very good, they're secret, but they're very good recommendations, actually. Um, but a lot of those things brought into force is going to serve to feed into that rebalancing of the profession, which is going to hopefully keep the teachers in once we get them in, making it manageable and putting the focus back on the teaching and learning and the focus back on the children and, and I suppose, balancing out the accountability agenda and so on. And those things are all there. And I think it's been recognised, even although it's not key in our pay talks, it's been recognised, I think, by management that, that these are important and they are looking at 
you know, a framework and it's being discussed in the same conversation. So I think there is an understanding that this is all going to help in, in, in order to bolster the profession as a whole. Okay, I'll yeah, just add yeah, that. Yeah, yes, Sorry, just a little nuance there. Money cannot be diverted away from resolving the pay dispute uh, mm -hmm. under the auspices of addressing some of the recommendations that yeah. should have been delivered mm -hmm. from the last pay dispute. Uh, but uh, we have all of our trade unions have school leaders in them in NAHT. I only represent school leaders. Uh, and we did a survey of members working hours not that long ago. On average, it's 54 hours a week. Um, not only is that unhealthy, in fact, it's dangerous, it's also illegal. And I actually cannot see how I can move away from this dispute without a significant tangible change in terms of workload for school leaders. Uh, it's very difficult for me to see how people can just go back to the status quo. People are getting sick, people are becoming unwell. Many of our members who are in school leadership are functioning in their job day to day, but are in seriously dangerous uh, state of health, particularly in mental health. We expect our employing authorities to act as good, decent employers and deal with this issue. So for me, uh, the pay issue is absolutely important and there is no way that money should be directed away from resolving the pay dispute uh, in order to address issues that should have been resolved from coming out of the last dispute. But there's no way I can move out of this dispute without something tangible in terms of workload for school leaders. Thank you. And look, I'll just ask one other question, just specifically on pay, and then I'll open it up to, to members. And look, I'm not asking you to, to go into detail in your, your negotiations, but to what extent is, is are the pay issues at the lower end of the scale critical to this? Because I'm very conscious there are very, very big disparities there for newly qualified teachers coming in in terms of other jurisdictions. So could you just give us a sense of of, of how critical that is in, 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 the, in terms of the current negotiations? I mean, I think in, in terms of getting uh, getting people into the profession and as, as Jackie has said for the recruitment of members they're critical but for the retention of members as you move up you know it's we 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 have to get to a point where people want to be teachers you know I, I saw the, the in the there was a press release about the um, the schools that were having capital bills coming out there's no point in having the best and the loveliest and the newest buildings there when you have no teachers to put into them. And something, something that was, was said, the problem here is nobody will go into certain principal's jobs because, the, you know, why would you go in and take on all the huge amount of responsibility and the huge amount of time if you're not getting remunerated properly? So it's it's there's not one sort of sort of person or person or there's not one of our members you would say it's more critical to sort their pay out everybody's pay has to be sorted but it has to be sorted out where, it's, where all of our members feel, feel that it's fair and it's equitable yeah, just, just coming in on the back of that um, in this part of the world we overproduce teachers I think we all heart at heart know that um, uh, yet we've got shortages in physics maths biology chemistry tech design and tech, home economics. Mm -hmm. And I mean, trust me, if you ask a school principal in your constituency how easy it is to get a sub-teacher, they'll tell you, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So we've managed to create, <coughs> we've managed to create a, 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 a teacher retention problem uh, in a glut. Now, anecdotally, I was speaking to a, a, a senior executive at one of our biggest tech firms, uh, and he was able to tell me that they uh, not only recruited but targeted to recruit two dozen qualifying teachers. He doesn't need teachers; he just needs bright people. Um, so they're not just going to teach in Scotland and Riyadh and Qatar or wherever they're going international schools in Europe. They're going into other graduate professions. Um, so there is a bit of a brain drain particularly in science and, and tech and, and, and maths, you know. 
And that, okay. that's been communicated to me very clearly mm. by, by secondary principals around mm. computer science. I mean, we, we can push STEM every day of the week, but if mm. you don't have really well-qualified people who are coming into the teaching mm. profession to deliver that stuff, how do you then bring forward that generation of, you know, of, of, of uh, pupils who are going to be STEM graduates, particularly, I think, in the area of, of coding and, and computer science? So, yeah. I, if I could just add to that, I mean, I find it particularly... I think it, it shows so starkly where we've got to because 20 years ago, young people were well aware that by get, they needed always needed the, the top grades, high-level grades to get in. We have a very talented, very you know expert teaching force, but teaching workforce. But they knew <coughs> at that time, I knew, we, we knew when we went into teaching that you could earn more money somewhere else. But there was a balance between the money and the drive and the, the love of teaching and the wanting to do it. And we've always had our teaching colleges oversubscribed and we've always had so many people wanting in and, and all the bright talent. And the fact that some of them are actually even aware of the fact that you can't move forward. I mean, we have young teachers who are reporting back to us that they're almost 30 and still living at home because they can't afford to leave home. I mean, that's shocking type of behaviour. But it's the fact that we have managed <laughs> over the last number of years to actually drive down that enthusiasm and that but because it just you cannot just do it for the love of it anymore. The love of it always came with a salary that kept your head above water. It never came with a massive, massive salary. But now the salary doesn't keep your head above water. And then as Mark says, we're losing we're losing that talent because our teachers are looked for in different industries and all over the world. They're well renowned for being very talented. I'm going to bring other members in now. Very conscious of time. My initial plan of keeping this by theme may, may be tricky, <laughs> so I'm just going to open it up to the floor. Um, I had an indication for Deputy Chair, would you want to come in first and then Ren Robbie? Okay. And, and just on the funding, and I accept the point you're making, Graham, that uh, this problem with funding hasn't arisen just over the last couple of years, it's been 12, 13 years uh, with uh, austerity. Uh, that and, and, and we all know that the education budget has been slashed over that period of time. Uh, hopefully things will change in the near future, but that remains to be seen. However, I just wanted to ask you about uh, the point you were making about how schools are funded. And you're talking about the funding should happen in a different way or a, a new model. Could you expand on that just a bit? Well... The, the funding model at the moment uh, is very old, very blunt, um, favours very heavily um, older children when actually uh, all of the research shows investment in early years will produce much more significant long-term results. The, you know all of that stuff. Uh, it's, all, it's all very much in the public domain. Um, the funding model that follows, uh, that uses free school meals as the sort of um, barometer for, for how money is allocated to schools is very blunt. It doesn't actually reflect uh, the, how the demographics within schools work. For example, autism, uh, dyslexia, things like that are present in every school, They're not in particular sections of society, although numbers, are, <coughs> numbers may reflect social deprivation and so on. But the people who are equipped, who are actually best placed, that's the, that's the term Peter Weir used to use uh, during COVID, the people who are best placed to actually make decisions uh, about the profile of children who are actually in front of them are the teachers, the people who are working with the children every day. The profile in a class changes every year as new children come in. The people who are working in schools surely are there to see the need in front of them. School leaders should be asked, what do you need to run your school? And here it is. It's very simple, is what, what I'm saying. I know it's overly simplistic, but if the system wasn't so concerned by protecting policy and protecting uh, initiatives that have been devised in some room somewhere very far away from the actual point of delivery, if the system was actually focused on outcomes for children right down at classroom level, the system would be asking school leaders, what do you need to make the provision most effective for your children? And then making that available. It works the opposite way around. Decisions are made based on money. This is how much you have. Good luck, make do. And that's what I mean whenever I say schools are struggling to provide the bare minimum. 
because they're given a pot of money and do your best with that. That's not good enough. I think one of the, one of the major issues that, that schools have is over 90% of the school budget goes on wages. And when, they, when teachers are moving up through the, the pay increments, the budget isn't changed to reflect the changes in pay. So schools are always running, they're losing money every year as teachers move up. If I opened a school tomorrow and I had brand, teachers just out of college, in 11 years they'd all be at the top of the scale and the money wouldn't change to reflect that. The other thing is they don't, <coughs> the inflation isn't factored in in terms of the, the budget. So for the last couple of years when we have had huge changes in the cost of uh, fuel and things like that, that hasn't been reflected in the budget. And I think just to, to put in two lines what Graham has just really said, what we need is we need the budget to reflect the needs of the school, not the school to work and work to the budget that's given to them. Okay. And uh, I'm not sure, do you want to stay on this theme of funding? I'm sure. very happy to, yeah. I'm just kind of conscious that a few people need to come in, but in their time. I'll just I'll <coughs> ask one more question uh, and sort of expand out a bit in terms of some of the stuff you were talking about, Mark. Uh, and I suppose at the back of what you were saying, I picked up anyway, was the whole issue of uh, educational underachievement. A uh, number of uh, of young people leaving school without qualifications and so on, and uh, I was disappointed. Therefore, when the independent review panel stated in their report that they found no evidence of any higher levels of underachievement here than in any of the other jurisdictions on these islands, and to me that flies in the face of all the evidence. And my difficulty then is if the department and the minister accept that as fact, then rather than prioritising <coughs> the issue of underachievement, uh, you know, which is going to have knock-on effects on society in general uh, and on the economy, you know, uh, the, 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 whole, the whole thing is flawed, therefore. So I, I know you've talked about exams uh, the GCSE in particular, yep. um, but uh, but you also mentioned the situation in the south as well, and ESRI brought out a comparative study of the two systems uh, last year. I'm wondering, would would the unions consider that there's a lot to learn from that uh, ESRI report? Yeah, I, I was involved in that research, and I think it's a very very good piece of research. Um, the starting point for our union. Um, Pat, is it, uh, and, and were the review missed or, or um, <coughs> succeeded in avoiding? Uh, the OECD did a, a, a country by country report a while ago, and it, and it measured the measure of social segregation in education. And social segregation in education is important because the stats tell you that where social segregation is minimalised, systems do well and fewer people go to jail and more people are healthy and the jobs are better, etc, etc. Out of 34 developed countries, the United Kingdom jurisdictions came 34th. So the most socially segregated education systems in the developed world. That's a, that's a horrendous stat. Now if you take the systems of the United Kingdom, as they said, th this region, Scotland, Wales and England, um, I can't see that Northern Ireland would be anything other than the worst of those. So, I mean, the reason why social segregation is important is that all the stats, there's complete academic consensus in this, all the stats from Coleman in the 1960s in the United States to today tells you <coughs> That, the, that, that for a, uh, an impoverished working class boy or girl that in a deprived area, the worst school for that person is a high poverty school. The best school is a socially mixed school. Uh, we sort of do the opposite. Our, our system is, is socially segregated. I'm not even getting near the argument about the 11 plus because this happens before the 11 plus. Um, 
I mean, the why is interesting because for the child from the working class area who's not, uh, you know, maybe difficult familial <coughs> circumstances, uh, the best role model is somebody uh, the same age, maybe plays the same sport, they mess about in the same websites and social media, listen to the same type of music, but crucially maybe one has a different attitude to learning than the other. Um, you know, so we actually need to think of this slightly differently. How do we, you know, we don't, our, like, our primary schools are, to try to get your point Pat, our primary schools actually do well by international benchmark. The Thames and the Pearls research tell us that our people at primary six are as good as the, the Pacific Rim, which is on top in Europe the last time in the Thames report in terms of literacy and reading. So our primary schools are comprehensive. There's no, there, you know, everybody goes to the local school. I get that in the bigger urban areas there are some poor schools and, you know, and there are some wealthier schools as it were, as it were. but by and large the, the intake is comprehensive. When you go to uh, the international benchmarking for post-primary, which is generally PISA, uh, PISA will tell you that we're bang average, a wee bit, a bit around about middle, not great, not fantastic. One of the interesting things the last PISA told us was actually that for a selective system, our high flyers, our best and brightest, do badly by international comparison in a selective system. That surprised me, but it, that's the truth of it. So I think if we focus on uh, social segregation, it's an easier argument to make, but that's where we're doing very, very badly. We are the most socially segregated amongst the most socially segregated systems in the developed world and that would be my starting point. Is there a view missed that Pat? Yeah, absolutely. Went to some trouble I would say to miss it. Very deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> I will, uh, I'll, bring, I'll bring Rob in and I'll ask if we could keep questions brief and answers brief also as, as time is now definitely against us. <coughs> I'm just going to roll it all up into one rather than sticking on one topic, if that's okay, guys. Yeah, um, and I'll just do two, I think. Um, so the first one is then, and, and Jackie spoke brilliantly about it, um, I think, uh, in regard to our teachers. So we, we, we did COVID, and there was a wonderful moment at one point where teachers actually, when people recognised the need for what schools and teachers did, there was a moment, and it was a brief moment, where um, the, there was a recognition and there was a, 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 a much broader public support for teachers and support. I, I have sensed that that has waned greatly because I, for the first time in a couple of years, now have teachers stopping me in the street. And I do genuinely believe that they're at the end of their tether. And this is, I'm going into this, reten this retention piece, um, and it's directly linked to the pay, obviously. But the other thing that has happened over this last lot of years is what we do, we tend to throw more stuff on this, our schools and throw more responsibility. And we got all these, you know, initiatives in them. They're all, most of them are good. So two, two parts to that question, if that's okay. How do, how, do, how do the unions feel about the additionality that's coming to schools? And what does that feel like for unions in terms of their negotiation with, with us as legislators? Because mm -hmm. if we're going to bring it, I'm not sure. I know what the department's relationship with you guys is like. What's it like with us? Um, private members, bills or whatever it is, or, or, or legi overarching legislation is brought in by the Secretary of State. Um, the retention piece, I'm really interested in this, because I, I have a fear that retention is going to be a significant issue if the pay isn't sorted out really, really soon, because I think the burden with the cost of living pressures on, on, on teachers is going to bear out. But a, a slightly more controversial one, I'm going to bring up because I have this in front of me, and it shouldn't be controversial because it was birthed out of the, the, the discussion around, and something struck me about the relationship between the boards of governors, parents, teachers, school leaders, and so on, um, and I'll declare an interest as a board of governor. Um, in the action short of strike action, there is uh, still the only uh, part of the UK where, where it's not illegal to not be assessed as a teacher in, in a classroom. So um, I just want to ask maybe for a reflection on that and ask is it something that unions here are up for a discussion on about uh, maybe changing the action sh short, uh, short of strike action? I think because I, I think in that one in particular, I'll give an example, I think in terms of when there is a dispute between the parent or a board of governor and a teacher, um, one of the safeguards for teachers is uh, is their performance in the reports and that type of thing. I think it's a it's one of those things that might actually work against teachers as opposed to any other issues that I would have with it. So if you want to maybe start with it, I, I just look. I just maybe pick that up because I thought you were getting that 
<coughs> a drive towards legislation uh, around inspection. That's what I thought mm -hmm. you meant. Yeah. It's, not, right. it's not what you meant. No, it's not. No, it's, okay. Yeah, it's in the action short of strike actions. Uh, it's just one of those issues I raised before previously. Can you maybe clarify then? It's not about. So it's the assessment just of teachers and lessons and, and that type of thing by, by heads and stuff. In, ter in terms of our industrial action, our industrial action in terms of, of the PRSD, the, the, which is the the appraisal system, the appraisal yeah. system that's available to schools, where teachers have to um, go through PRSD to get a, a, an increase in their wage, that's continued, <coughs> and that has always continued. One of the reasons that we put that onto our industrial action was because of the amount of time that it takes for everybody across the board to get get through that, and um, we do because because it was of, of absolutely no real use to the teachers unless they were going to have to go through it to get paid. We we decided to put it on. Um, in terms of of what our principals can or can't do, our principals in most cases know exactly what their teachers are and what their teachers are good at and what their teachers aren't good at. Our problem <coughs> often is where you have a teacher who isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Schools are very um, very poor at using the procedures that are open to them. And rather than go down the effective teacher route, they often go directly to a uh, disciplinary route, which causes more problems. You know, so a part of it is you know, govern and governance and things like that, it's known what, what procedures that are available to you to make it to be most effective. So, you know, in terms of our industrial action, look, if we get our pay deal sorted out, we'll be coming off all our industrial action. Yeah. You know, we have, we have suspended a, a strike action. We continue with our action short of strike <coughs> action. But as, Jack, as Jackie pointed out, of the points that we have of an industrial action, more than half of them are actually contractual duties. That you're being, other things that you've been asked to do, which are outside your contract. Mm -hmm. so that's you know, my point about the additionality. So I have, I have great, um, huge respect for teachers and, and, and schools, and I think it's one of the hardest places yeah. to, to actually and, work. But and, 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 and just in terms of that, then in terms of new things being brought in, yeah. we're more than happy where where we can see value of new things being brought in. The problem is, it's like oh, if you have a bucket full of water, to put more water in, you have to take something out. And, and what we have asked for and, and what was agreed at the last pay deal was that if something was going to come into your school, it would be workload proofed. Yeah, we and that doesn't happen as often as it should. In the context, just before it goes out of my just head, ask though, for, for brief answers yeah, here where we're other briefly, members looking to come in. Th yeah. Those procedures that Mark was talking about in terms of support and effective teaching and support programmes, none of that was in the industrial action. That was down to the governors whether they put that forward. We did not seek in any way to, to leave a child with a, an underperforming teacher. That was not in the industrial action. So, I mean, that would be for governors to move forward on that, if, if that's what you're talking about. Well, to no, address I mean, an that, issue within yeah. the school, is that what you mean? No, no, I, I, no, I, so I've raised this previously with you in, yeah. just in regards to the inspection, just or just a normal, the, the standard two, two, two inspections of a class a year. But I was just thinking in terms of the protections of the teacher, some, it's one of the things that I think could be... Yeah. Just a, a, as a benefit to, to maybe re removing it as a, an action? Just just before you go, Graham, because menopause looks out of my head. Um, <laughs> the way back at the beginning in 2020, before we even started the work on those reviews, we had three upfront asks, and it was to do with time budgets. And so, but we don't have to go into that now, and I'm trying to be brief. But the very the, the third one was a commitment between management side and, and trade unions that there would any new initiative would be workload impact assessed. So something coming in, we would look at very simple things like what does it replace? What benefit is there in it for the children? You know, what are we trying to achieve with this? Very, quite straightforward. Um, we got a commitment statement outlining that and it has never happened. It has never happened. So you're talking about things that can be put in place. <coughs> Through that, the, the workforce review and through those kinds of... We have got the tools in place. We've done the work. All we need is to actually get the shoulder to the wheel and get those things put in, and we will see change. That's our belief, and we, we put enough work into them. So, you know, there are... So I'm going to have to come in. We have three yeah. other members looking so, to come in, and we really are. I'll just say, well, right out, of, right, right out, of, right out of time <laughs> on this. Uh, yeah, that's now four members. So, I just want to uh, yeah. just want to last. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sorry, yeah. No, no, I'll be really, really quick. Robbie, we we agree with you. We want to see an end of the action short strike. We want to see an end of this dispute. 
we ask you to join us to lobby the Department of Education in particular to make the resources available to end this dispute. The ball's in their court. This thing could be over in weeks or less. And just with regards to new initiatives and things that are coming in the future, uh, one thing that I think we are all going to be doing in the future on the other side of this dispute is when a new initiative comes, we're going to say no. What comes off the table to make space to this? What additional resource is going to come with this to make it possible? <coughs> and that's it. That's, that's the new world we're going to have to be in to make the job sustainable as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. And I would propose with members' agreement if, that, that we, we write to the Minister in that regard. I think the committee on the back of the discussion today, that, that we ask for, for a commitment from the Minister in writing that the Department will be making the necessary resources available to resolve this dispute because I think everybody, teachers, anyone, children using the system, and it's in everybody's interest that this is resolved. So if members are agreed, we could take that agreed. forward. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, uh, and I, I am really asking for members here to, to, to help me out with time and, and to be as brief as possible. So, Cathy, if yes, you want to come. And I, I promise I will be. Um, Maxine, it's actually just on the on the saying stuff. Yep. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned about you know children in mainstream schools just, just not getting the same level of care. But that's obviously all down to the, the pressure that's been put on our, on our special schools. Um, but it's a specific issue, and it probably ties into this, the things being um, added on, on to teachers um, around the team teach training. Yeah. And I know specifically, I just want to know if it's an issue that you're finding. It, it is, and I'm glad you mentioned that, because, for example, that is one thing that they, the Education Authority are not providing. So you have set up, so a child <coughs> should have went to a special school, yeah. in our view, and in yes. the teacher's view. So they've set up a unit mm -hmm. in a mainstream school. Now, it's a unit of the mainstream school, but because the teachers are not in a special school, they won't provide the team teach yeah. training. Yeah. So what, I'm really glad that you've mentioned that because it is a particular yeah. problem because our mm -hmm. members are saying to us, look, there are difficult behaviour problems within the school. I go back to the issue over violence within mm -hmm. the schools. Team teach is a way that provides people with a safe way of handling. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, and, and they're in these units, usually with themselves in classroom assistance, and potentially not, they're definitely not team teach trained. Yeah. Yeah. The other problem you have is that within a special school, you have a number of teachers and classroom assistants who are all trained within the team teach or they've had experience or over the over the time and the team teach needs to be renewed on a very regular basis but even within a special school i have colleagues who are who have or are experienced and you know what strategies are you using so there's much more able to to um gain that knowledge from others mm -hmm. around it, how you help and what interventions you can use. So yeah, it's a big concern we have. Um, sorry, again brief. Just on is that something that's coming directly from the EA? They are not given that they, we our members have reported to us that they've been told by the when they've asked for that by the Education Authority that it will not be provided because they they only provide it to teachers in a mainstream school or yeah. sorry staff because it's also classroom assistants can be trained yeah. in it as well. And that is really concerning because these children should be in yeah. A special school. Yeah. But because we don't have the room for them, they've been put into a unit attached there's, to mainstream. There's actually a, a case in my own constituency where there, there's a, a special school here and then one of these units just down the road. And these guys in this unit are being told to go to the special school and ask for training of their staff. Which, as you know, the staff in this special school don't have the capacity, the time, the resources or anything to be providing that. So it's something that's extremely... Concerning. I think one also was told that they would they would have to, and the difficulty is even sourcing it, even if they could get the money, and it goes back mm -hmm. to money, you know, mm -hmm. that if they, they've been told, I think on one of them, that if you can source it yourself, but where do you go to on that, and how yeah. do you, you know, there, so there's big difficulties there, so in, in our view with those <coughs> mainstream units, it's nearly been, we've got the child sorted, the child's in a place, but the, the support around them, and that's yeah. where we're getting at at this, it's the support around those children, and the support around the teachers and the staff who are trying to provide it just isn't there yeah. and I think that is that providing a good experience and you know then you're going to end up where teachers are going to say we can't cope with the child then you're looking which you probably know smaller shorter times yeah. which is putting more pressure on the family unit as well as on the yeah. school yeah no absolutely thanks for that thank you information. could I could I just make two very quick points one of them to do with the fact that even when you get the team teach within the special schools the time isn't allowed in order to that's cascade training you know, you have two members of staff trained and then they're supposed oh, to train right, right. other members yes. of staff. Yeah. Okay. But there isn't a time created yeah. within the, the, the day to be able to do that. Okay. One other thing that we've we've had raised about the, the 
classrooms in the mainstream schools. We have sought information about you know the way forward for those children and so on, and we were sent the um, the, the the framework, if you like, for yeah. 2022 to 27 or whatever. That's not really the issue um, that some of our teachers have in those schools. It's meaningful progression through education for those children in that room. Mm -hmm. They go into that room. Where do they go next next year? Where do they go? Or do they stay there for Key Stage 1 and progress? Because if you have a child in there, they need to feel, regardless of their needs, they need to feel they're moving through the system and growing and maturing and developing. And to do that, they can't. You can't just put them into yeah. a room, yeah. and then we'll move on to the next lot. Yeah. And there are concerns about that, and we've tried to to get information on that, and, and we haven't got information on that. And I know it's something that, you know, it's important in the in the overall educational experience for yeah. for those children. Do you know, just the same way that any any child with yeah. fewer needs, if yes. you like, they're moving, they're progressing. Absolutely. So uh, Thank you. Thanks for that. Well, uh, yet indicated next. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for um, proposing this be our first evidence um, a session that we have. I think it's so important that you know that we are listening to you. I have a list of a million questions which I'm not going to go through um, because I hopefully you'll be back soon. Um, but the one thing that's really struck me through all your presentations um, is just the magnitude of the problems. Um, and it's uh, hearing loud and clear about the, the pay um uh, pay and um, the lack of trust on <clears throat> following the review. Um, what's happening with with SEN and eighty percent of um, staff uh, suffering um, physical abuse and violence? Um, listening to, to head teachers, what they need, um, exams, how it's uh, it's so it's so um, result driven. And I guess I'm curious about the, this kind of lack of communication, lack of trust and engagement seems to be something that's coming up a lot and um, how would that be better with the department what would what would that look like maybe maybe um kate we should we should say that within the negotiating machinery actually relationships are very good and fairly trusting okay. um so you know i'm in, i'm involved in the further education negotiations and they are far from trusting but you know, relationships yes. are yeah. Yeah. as good as they've been. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Within so. the yeah. within the um, within the negotiating machinery, uh, that's all I can say. <coughs> so I, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Um, there, there, the problems are incomprehensibly large. It's, I mean, the denigration of the entire education system and all the scaffolding that holds it up over the past 13 years is profound. And even if many millions of pounds were put into the system tomorrow, it's going to take a generation. Uh, firstly, it, it cannot be the case that the same is expected of schools as was expected 13 years ago because they don't have the resource to deliver. The expectation remains the same. Indeed, the challenge has increased uh, during this period of time, but everything that schools need, including the, all of the provisions around the schools that support children and families and communities, has all been dismantled. It's going to take a very long time, great ambition and huge investment. What needs to happen from the system's point of view? Mark's right, relationships are good, but we represent the workforce that delivers. We're often consulted in ways that are information sharing not genuine consultation, and then something bad goes out to the system and our members say, what happened here? And we say, we haven't been consulted. And the system says, oh, we met with the unions on such and such a date. That's when you gave us a page and said, we're thinking of this, and we said, don't do that. (laughs) That's not consultation. Consultation has to be genuine and has to actually inform practice. And there are some things that we're deeply concerned about. the, The issue you mentioned about there and these specialist provision mainstream units, this is a direction of travel that greatly concerns us. And my words represent a form of neglect of some of our most vulnerable children Mm. and has to be paused and reflected on very seriously. We've really missed the education committee over the past two years because some things have been progressed really rapidly and in great detail that are very questionable from outcomes for children perspective. 
and we've missed the scrutiny that the Education Committee should be providing during this period of time. <coughs> and I think there are some huge things underway that need to be paused, and that this issue with CY, Children and Young People Services in EA and the drive to put some of our most vulnerable children in mainstream settings with a pretense, uh, a sort of pseudo package of support around them, which doesn't really exist at the levels that are being presented. Uh, this has to be paused, and your committee needs to look at it very, very carefully. Can We've I, uh, certainly can I, can highlighted that, that that week one was highlighted almost, I think, mm -hmm. but before any other issue, that, that the provision around SEN was what would have mm -hmm. to be priority for this committee. So Just one to. example of that, to go back to Jackie's point about where do we go. So we have there's been over this last year, because of the numbers going into P1, a lot of our special schools then, they, they would have had a nursery and then a P1, but they had to replace their nursery with P1. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're already aware of that, and that is something that we cannot see continue because our members are saying that difference when they for those children and their progression is something that has to it, it has to be brought back again they, those children and I know the independent review of education has talked about age two but there's something that really needs to be done in this this next academic year we cannot have another year of children who are not getting that nursery school provision. Actually this is urgent because yeah. these 950 children with severe learning difficulties who were who appeared in May. in May last year with this sort of narrative around them that we didn't know these numbers were coming, crisis, uh, let's cram them in really wherever we can and do what we can for them. The same is going to happen again this year and it's only a couple of months away and there is a crisis and you'll, you'll hear presentations from within the system that say we, we have this whole package for them and it's going to be wonderful. Practitioners are telling us, in some cases it actually is, because in some cases the expertise and the resource uh, and the skill set within the staff already exists. So some mainstream schools are managing well, but we're hearing from many members that they're deeply concerned about the impact for those children and for the other children in schools. That we, we, that's a crisis just, that we're right in. We'll probably have to move on to the next, oh, right, uh, just the next member. Was there, was there another trust. point of kids not, not picked up? Okay. Was it? If it, if it can be dealt with briefly, it, it's I really want to hear from you, but I'm also conscious yeah. we have a, the department in after this, which will be another lengthy presentation, so we want to make sure we have time on that. So. Very I'm just quickly. very quickly going to talk, and we can pick up on it, but, but the trust issue comes from, as Mark says, relationships that we have mm -hmm. you know, around the negotiating table are good, but as I said about the reviews, the recommendations, the pay, it's the workforce out there who see nothing coming yeah. through except more things you know and they're not more seeing the processes that there's no transparency because of the system um, and so therefore that that trust is breaking down really between the workforce and the employers if you know yeah, what I mean but we can fine. expand on that at some yeah, point. Apologies if anybody is okay, feeling rushed sorry. but uh, the time is definitely against us. Uh, David if you want to come in. I'm not sure. Um, a couple of questions. Just um, probably Graham first. You'd said about your members. I think it was fifty-seven hours, and, and that being unsustainable, and not can understand the frustrations in that. Um, just as a new member, well, new member of the assembly, but certainly a new member of the, the education committee. Uh, is that primarily? Do you th is that a staffing issue primarily, or is there particular elements that you give examples of where you think that um, you should be stepping back from, or that? You're talking about, or was it your, your colleague here talked about the, the bucket and being full and something having to be taken off the table before someone's put on. Is there elements on the table at the minute that you don't think you should be dealing with, or, or what, and what are they? Absolutely. Well, the work, there, there's one of the reviews we talked about earlier is the review of workload impact and school leaders. In that review, there are 29 recommendations, and they address exactly of what you're describing. And what's really important about those recommendations is they were agreed with representatives from the teaching yeah. workforce. They were also agreed by representatives of the Department of Education, the Education Authority, CCMS, and management side. Those are 29 recommendations that have been agreed to reduce workload and the workload impact for school leaders. They've been sitting on a desk now for over a year, and nothing has moved. Nothing. So there is one of the, uh, our actions short of strike, well, all of ours, uh, we put a limit for school leaders. Uh, we used a senior civil servant uh, contract and we took 37 and a half hours and said, let's view that as a reasonable ceiling. What we're going to be expecting coming out of this is that gradually we will be assessing our members' uh, working week and seeing a reduction of that 50 odd hours a week 
toward i mean we we expect to see that reduced gradually stuff has to come off their desk and that workload review has the answers some of them are free some of them are easy it's incomprehensible <laughs> that some of them haven't actually been delivered yet just as an act of goodwill from employers who want to look out for their workforce uh, all the answers are there you, you should um, ask the Department of Education for a little look at those reviews. The recommendations are very straightforward. On that, I mean, we've agreed as a committee we would write to the Minister around the resources for the pay. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's appropriate we, we ask for, for an update on how they're going to deliver on that workforce review. Um, so we'll you should ask for the recommendations. And, and, and reasonable. absolutely, that's have cited yeah. them, yeah. So for if the committee's agreed on that, yeah. Agreed. And just uh, secondly, um, to Mark, um, the the idea of having more vocational options and so on that you touched on and, and that idea of reform of the GCSE and so on but it's something that's always intrigued me as to why sometimes we wait to um, put, uh, after school almost and people are looking for further education before we sort of introduce options to them that are sometimes more suited to um, their their skill set and their natural sort of what, what, what they're um, naturally gifted in and so on um, so I guess um, it's a question of how, um, what would what what do you think that would look like in terms of and how we do it because I know you work with some of our um, further education colleges and you talk about the fluidity between the two, um, but you'll be aware those those uh, further education colleges are sort of squeezed from both ends in terms of yeah. schools and universities encroaching slightly perhaps and, and and how do we make that work. Um, and, and also then how in reform of GCSEs do we, um, if you were looking at reform of GCSEs, how would you have a system whereby those benchmarks that are important, important to employers or uh, other educational establishments are, are able to be taken as sort of standardised and people can understand that what level pupils are at, at a, in a particular topic um, for the pupils good as much as for the, the employer or the, the education. Yeah, I'll take the last one first. I mean, I mean uh, in talking about this, it seems a very radical step to uh, dispense with GCSEs. Uh, but then when you think it's not a terminal exam, what does it really matter? I think the system probably would require some sort of uh, test at that stage, certainly for maths and, and, yeah. and reading and, and ICT capability and so on. So there's probably a, a room for movement there. In terms of of different routes, <clears throat> um, in my spare time I'm involved in an education programme at Monkstown Boxing Club, which is one of those sort of alternative education things. Where, But I think what gets in the way is is the, the behavioural effects of funding. There used to be a very successful programme called the Vocational Education program where schools and colleges didn't have to compete for bodies where the you know the college set out uh, a series of vocational areas that the schools were able to go into that and that was funded so I think we need to look at you know instead of uh, losing the really good work there and collaboration between schools and colleges just because of a funding formula um, we've thought for some time that the boundary between colleges and schools is is messy. There are schools delivering stuff that they shouldn't be doing. Mm. Yeah. There are colleges that are inappropriately, you know, dipping into. Yeah. So there, there's actually a bit of work for somebody to say, guys, you do this, and guys, you do that. Yeah. Some of our techs have fantastic equipment, engineering equipment, uh, labs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that some schools don't. So. Um, so the vocational education program worked because it took a pot of money out of both departments and said that's for thee, uh, work it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it's down to, okay, the child goes there or there, the school principal will make it uh, attract the state school, the college will do their best. To, you know, we're into a game about poaching because of mm -hmm. funding mechanisms. We shouldn't be there. We should... We should do something interdepartmental that allows that collaboration to work. Um, and I think, you know, uh, not solely for boys, but, but I think of boys particularly at, at 13, 14, who are not particularly engaged in school, um, losing interest, maybe starting to cause bother, getting themselves in trouble. Vocational routes at that stage, I think, is part of the answer, you know. I think that it's to do with the focus. I think of our system. We should be look. We should be focusing the system around 
finding a pathway for a child going through mm. and not shoving a child down yeah. a path because it happens to be there. Yeah. You know? I think it makes sense in terms of, as well, we're trying to ensure in future, as we've talked about for a long time, making sure apprenticeships and, and mm. vocational qualifications are seen as on par with yeah, those yeah. At, at university. Um, then we're getting there a bit, yes. David. You know, with yeah. the with the higher level apprenticeship, you know, it's yeah. it's it's a viable route. And if the if the independent review is going to you know recommend that our university fees go up, more and more parents and young people will choose a yeah. you know a Thank learning you. a learn and earn route. You know, mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. Here from the independent review, there's a lot of recommendations in the interface between schools yeah. and, and and further in higher education that, that that definitely bears a lot of scrutiny. And Cara, if I could bring you thank in, thank you, uh, Chair, and I'll try and be brief and just thank you all so much for being here. What a comprehensive brief for us, and what is our second week? Um, and I'm new to education as well, so I found it extremely helpful. Um, just on the point of uh, challenges with special educational needs, I recently attended Rossmore Special School in Limavady, incredible mm-hmm. building, yeah. um, and I really agree with all of you. Just the point around um, what is the point of brand new buildings they're you know sparkly but we need to take care of the staff within it and then to touch on I spoke with a number of classroom assistants who were saying just you feel um, undervalued and underpaid and unsupported and um, so uh, everything you've said here today is definitely resonating with myself and the challenges are I suppose we want to make teaching seem like this exciting dynamic profession but morale is so low because we continue <coughs> to see these challenges which are historical um, and these cuts continue and I'm also worried as well just put on record about retirement at the other end and then we're going to struggle to bring young people in who want to train as teachers here Um, and thank you to Mark as well for the book recommendation Um, but also the discussion on uh, looking at the transition year and I'd actually heard uh, of this previously and I think it would be a fantastic opportunity if we had something similar like that for our young people to know importantly what they don't want to do as much as as what they want to do Um, and I think that's really important Um, but just to reassure you today uh, we're here we're listening uh, to teachers and I really appreciate just how child focused the conversation has mm. been and your point on being detached from the delivery that's on the ground each and every day with children I think was a really important point I just have two questions um, one of them is burnout uh, in teachers mm-hmm. stress and burnout massive issue um, I hear it a lot uh, in my constituency and I'm just wondering is that something the Department of Education keeps record on and um, what level of mental health support um, can teachers receive and then just the second question Jaggy um, you had talked about uh, those cost neutral recommendations and despite the fact there is no cost attached, they still haven't been implemented. If you could maybe touch on one or two of them, just if you have them at the top of your head, I'd find that really helpful. Thank you all. Um, I suppose first of all, yeah. when you talk about burnout, burnout, what they do provide with, with within the education system is access to counselling service. So that is probably, other than what's provided which I'm going to be looking, you know, we look at our head, you know, our principals, um, they're usually the ones who will be providing the support to their staff. But once it goes beyond, you do have access to Inspire, which is quite, which is useful, <coughs> I, you know, because we, we're not saying it's not, it definitely is useful. But our, I suppose our issue is a lot of times the principals are under so much pressure. It's nearly like until somebody actually does drop, and we, what we're trying to say in those discussions are saying, look, you're asking them to do all of this. We need to take something off so that they can keep going because otherwise they're going to get really unwell yeah. and we don't want that. And yes, you know, and members have said to me, how's counselling going to help me with the amount of workload? Yeah. And you're going, yes, well, one, there's a small word called, which is N-O. I'm not doing it, no. Uh, and the other side of it is, look, the counsellor may well assist you in just on how you're dealing with it and able to cope with that yourself, but they're right. Mm-hmm. Counselling isn't going to help them whenever they're maybe working 50, 60 hours a week and it's not going to help them with that. Mm-hmm. But that's about all is provided. And I'm not under it. I'm not trying to play it down because it I is useful. I think one of the but issues obviously is the burnout's the, the as well, issue. Where, where teachers have, have, have set out that they are under stress or whatever and they go to the occupational health and occupational health makes recommendations. They're not always acted upon because they're, they're recommendations. Something has to be done with that where um, changes are, could be put in place which would allow the teacher to return to work and get back into their normal things. Because they're done as recommendations, they don't have to be done. And I think something needs to be looked at in terms of that, that where an occupational health report says this is what the teacher needs. The school needs to have to take cognizance of it rather than, yeah, we'll work with it if it suits us. And it goes back to the fact <clears throat> that the funding isn't available sometimes. You know, where a teacher needs more time off or whatever, the school can't always afford it. Course, and yeah. there, there are those issues.
Yeah. yeah. One, one of the great there are some good provisions of the counselling and so on. There's some there are some good ideas that exist in the system, but they're all plasters over a very significant problem. Yeah. And just as a very quick personal example, I used to be a school principal yeah. in a really wonderful wee school. The greatest relief for me in my new job, my, and this job uh, is highly pressured and there's a great deal of responsibility, but this job is possible. The job of being a school principal is impossible. Yeah. Every day I was under so much strain, uh, I was deeply upset, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't resource my teachers to do what they needed to do. I couldn't meet the community's needs of my school. I had children in front of me that really upset me because I felt that no matter what we did for them, in some cases, particularly children with, with complex needs, it was never good enough. It was impossible. And until that, and until the, what is expected of schools yeah. is looked at with the finite resource that schools have. And one of the difficulties is, Maxine said the word NO, uh, teachers are more and more rightly saying no to mm -hmm. things that are outside of their contractual expectations, but schools are still expected to deliver them. If, if teachers don't do them, who does? That, then it ends up with the principal or the vice principal. The stuff still needs to be done, still the expectation exists. It's actually impossible. Until that is solved, yeah. it doesn't matter what well-being support there is people are absolutely people right i was just cope. saying you know outside of the classroom one in ten <coughs> children uh, experience poverty and then we have cuts to um you know programs to help with food poverty and then we know that um, mental health challenges more young people are coming forward for help there funding's being cut there um and so you're absolutely right challenges outside the classrooms and then the increase with special educational needs as well everything feels squeezed and there's a real sense of crisis but yeah, totally. thank you thank you both yes and just off the top of my head yeah. then some of the, the sort of more non-additional costs one mm -hmm. I think they said we referenced earlier on the the new initiatives yeah. we looked at I mean there's no cost to the engagement to you know with teachers and, and with policy makers if you like to work out the the value of the new initiative and how it works and what do we replace and so on and to rebalance the day one of the things that we hear a lot from school leaders um, and part of that stress, Graham, is duplication of information that they're requesting. So you get, you're asked for data from the department and you're asked for the same data from EA and you're asked for the same data from somewhere else. There doesn't seem to be any... The, the easy thing to do is go to the school. Mm -hmm. The easy mm -hmm. thing to do is just ask the school. And you've got a school leader who would not be burned out and stressed and all of that, and the teachers wouldn't either, if they were spending their time teaching and learning. Yeah. That's not what's burning people out. Mm -hmm. What's burning people out is doing the jobs of other people. Yeah. We are seeing things like within our SEN arena, for example, where all of a sudden something that used to be the job of the social worker is now the job of the yeah. teacher. Fill in the form in that used to... The social workers are saying, I didn't know I didn't have to do that anymore. And it has just come out of nowhere. And co proper consultation, having our practitioners involved in the way forward, looking <coughs> at what works. They are the people who know what works for the children in the classroom. And they do not find anything hard work if it's involved, that they're seeing a teaching and learning benefit in it it's it's things around the outside cost neutral things like there are we need to evaluate we need to assess we need to do all of those things a teacher is a professional person who could point to any child in, in her or his or her class and tell you exactly where they are mm -hmm. but instead the system has evolved where you are writing notes to yourself about yourself to about the children yeah. do you know when it can be streamlined down nobody's stepping aside from accountability mm -hmm. nobody's stepping aside from showing that you're doing the job that you're supposed to be doing but it has just mushroomed the type the amount of time spent on paperwork which actually when you drill down into it find the paperwork that's useful yeah. and that benefits the child and then put the rest to the side that's just a few examples off the top of my head. <laughs> I see the pressure in your face. They're, they're definitely, the clock is, is yeah. well, very I, I just taken. want to say thank you because yeah. you acknowledged, uh, and it's really important to us, the child-focused nature of this conversation. Yeah. Sometimes as officials and trade unions, we have to be belligerent mm -hmm. and awkward, and that's part of our job. Sometimes we have to be quite robust as part of our job. All we actually want is that our members 
are equipped to do their job happily, safely, and in a way that's sustainable into the future. <coughs> so I, re I just really appreciate that th we want our members to be able to deliver for children. Ultimately, I think that's why we're here. And I think it's really encouraging to hear from the teaching unions that that's the message we're hearing, that it's, mm. this, is, this is ultimately about outcomes for children and young people. Yes, it's okay. about teachers paying conditions and all yeah. that is vital, but it's, it's all about delivering a system that, that works for our children and young people. So I think that's, it's good to hear that, that, that that's the place you're coming from. So, so th thank you all for your time. And that has been a long evidence session, but I think it's really important that, you know, first off, that we got the chance to hear from you. And I, and I, I want to say sincerely, the committee is, is committed to continuing that engagement. Um, and on all of those policy areas, as we explore them in more detail, we will be, we'll be seeking your views. Thank you. Thank you. Comfort break, and then we will bring the department in. Yeah. Committee room 29. Sound. Um, and we have we have quorum, so we'll 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 just make a, a start. Um, so I'll just very quickly ask the clerk to recap um, any actions arising from the last uh, item, and then we will bring in the next. Uh, witnesses for their evidence session. Okay, um, I think everybody agreed that that was a very child-centred session and the high-level message was that nothing can be prioritised before teacher pay. Then there was a lot of um, discussion of over-examination, social diversity, governance at school level, governance in arm's length bodies, workforce planning, school budget setting um, and the funding formula. The committee agreed to write to the minister to ask him to provide, provide the resources needed to end the dispute and to ask for recommendations of a workforce review. Um, and the witnesses did stress that relationships in the negotiations are as good as they have been. Um, so that will help lead into this session now. So uh, thank you, Clark, and that, that moves us on to item eight, uh, which is the presentation from uh, the Department of Education. So we're happy to bring them through. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, and thank, thank you for your for your patience, uh, and thank you for for uh, joining the the, the committee uh, this afternoon. So I would just refer members to the briefing papers, uh, pages one six seven to one seven six, <coughs> and then there is a briefing paper supplied by the department, which is at page fourteen of table papers. So yes, welcome uh, to you all this afternoon. Um, welcome Dr. Uh, Mark Brown, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary from the Department. Uh, Ronnie Armour, Deputy Secretary, Resources, Governance and Early Years Department. And uh, Lindsay Farrell, uh, Deputy Secretary uh, in the Department also. So uh, we're asking for, for an initial brief pre presentation um, on your initial uh, priorities and that would be for 10 minutes and then we will, as a, as a suggested timing, and then we will move to questions from members. Uh, so over to, over to you and, and thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, very much welcome the opportunity to be here with you today um, to talk about challenges and opportunities in the education sector. Education is key to uh, giving our children and young people the best start in life. So, the education sector is currently facing some of the, the greatest challenges that we've seen in a generation. There's been underinvestment in education for at least the last 10 years, with inadequate resource and capital budgets. That's also been a period of rising costs, sustained industrial action, COVID, and the impact this has had on the emotional health and well being, along with rising levels and complexity of need uh, amongst our children and young people all of which has had a very damaging impact. The independent review, which was uh, published recently, highlighted the need for proper investment in education to improve outcomes, reduce disadvantage, and contribute to a stronger society and economy. There's a need for investment to address the outstanding industrial relations issues, and I'm aware you had the NITC <coughs> in just before us, uh, so that needs to include pay. Action short of strike over a protracted period has taken a significant toll Morale amongst the teaching and the non-teaching workforce 
uh, is low. And although we have maintained positive relationships with our trade union partners, we have been limited in the progress that we've been able to make in several important areas. Non-cooperation, for example, with school inspections is of particular concern and is having a detrimental impact on our collective efforts to empower improvement so that every child and young person can access high-quality learning opportunities. We need sustained investment that allows us to plan effectively, that provides fair and attractive pay packages for our teaching workforce and our vital school support staff, and that, all, that supports a significant programme of professional development. This is critical to ensure that we can retain and develop our teaching profession and our support staff and ensure that they're rewarded and celebrated for the difference they make to our young people's lives. We need sustained capital investment also. We have an ageing and dispersed goods estate and a 15-year backlog in planned maintenance. This year our capital budget was cut by 9%, with no in-year funding made available, meaning that difficult decisions were required to manage our finances, including stopping all new major works, all new youth capital and all new school enhancement construction contracts. It's vital also that we get the necessary funding to complete the Struhl Educational Campus, uh, that that is recommitted to the education sector and to the Struhl project, which is an executive and a departmental priority. In light of these significant challenges, we urgently need clarity on the financial package promised by the Secretary of State, how that funding is to be allocated to ensure both stabilisation and future transformation. <coughs> So with many challenges to overcome, but that hasn't prevented us from identifying opportunities uh, and taking steps on an ambitious programme of transformation. The Department is progressing work on a range of areas for change, including the landscape review of the Education Authority, end-to-end -end reviews of school improvement and special educational needs. Firstly, and perhaps most critically, we need to reposition education as a key pillar of our society and the economy. For many years, our education system has been applauded as world-leading, and there's no doubt our young people continue to enjoy many of those benefits. However, we have significant problems, and we can't take this for granted. We need continued, sustained investment to ensure the quality of experience for our children and young people today, uh, and to support our economic and social development goals in the longer term. Refocusing around the school improvement agenda is crucially important for the Department recognising that high quality teaching and learning are fundamental to positive educational outcomes for our children and young people. And that end to end review of school improvement will not only refresh the current school improvement policy, every school a good school, but also will, uh, importantly, will consider how we can ensure our curriculum is monitored, reviewed and delivered in an agile way that meets the needs of a changing economy and society. And running through that review will also be a renewed focus on teacher professional learning in recognition of the fact that the quality of an education system can never exceed the quality of its teachers. So recognising the professionalism of our teachers and building their knowledge and skills throughout their careers is an investment that we must make if we are to safeguard the profession and ensure the best outcomes for our pupils. The end, -end review of special educational needs is of particular strategic significance given the increasing number of children presented with special educational needs over recent years and the increasing complexity of those needs. The changing profile of the children and young people is a consequence of a number of factors and has highlighted the need for urgent uh, reform across our system. The Department's ambitious reform agenda recognises that our children need to receive the right support at the right time from the right people in the right place. And sustained investment will be required to put in place an effective early intervention model that meets children's needs in a more responsive way, to develop a more comprehensive and ongoing programme of professional learning for our teaching and our non-teaching staff, ensuring our workforce is confident and capable uh, to meet the changing needs of our children, and also to ensure that our children receive the most appropriate placement to meet their needs. So looking ahead, every transformational journey must start with a vision uh, and a clear sense of direction. And I firmly believe that we should have high aspirations for all children and young people, regardless of their ability or background, ensuring that their needs are foremost in all that we do. The Department's focus, therefore, is to put children and young people at the heart of everything we do. We have an ambitious vision of every child and young person being happy, learning and succeeding. And that vision is articulated in more detail in our recently published corporate plan, Every Child. And the priorities are aligned with the areas I've covered today. And they include 
First of all, the acronym of CHILD, so the C is championing all our, cho our children and young people and the positive impact of education on all aspects of life. The H is helping all our children and young people where they need support for their learning and well-being. The I is inspiring all our children and young people to make a positive contribution to society. Um, the L is meeting the learning needs of our children and young people and developing their knowledge and skills, enabling them to fulfil their potential. And the D is delivering an effective, child-focused, collaborative, high-quality education system. So that will guide our transformation uh, agenda as we look to make gains across each of these areas, including a more sustainable model of investment, fit-for-purpose support for children and young people uh, and the workforce, a built a state and an education system that work in harmony in the interests of our children and young people. We must ensure we have a curriculum that supports our children to navigate today's world and prepares them for the opportunities and challenges of tomorrow, which is well implemented and kept under regular review. Aligned to this, we need a suite of qualifications that will ensure our young people have clear pathways and opportunities to make an effective contribution to society and the economy. I believe that the return of ministers and the executive presents genuine and exciting opportunities to begin a journey of transformational change which will help to alleviate many of the challenges that we face. And working together, we can make a real difference. In his first week in office, the Minister has highlighted his determination to resolve the teachers' pay dispute and commission a capital investment strategy so that children can be educated in schools which are comfortable and safe, are of good quality, and are properly designed and resourced to support their learning. In addition, the Minister has submitted funding bids of £528 million to the Department of Finance to meet education capital needs next year, and it's also emphasised that the department requires at minimum an additional £100 million of capital above the draft budget allocation to meet pressures in regard to special educational needs placements. And as a signal of his intent, the Minister has also lifted the pause that had been imposed on new bill projects for seven of the schools on that list that are in the worst condition. The Independent Review of Education panel published its report on the 13th of December and it's, it's timely that this coincides with the return of the executive. The review is extremely wide-ranging, covering almost every aspect of education, and we are currently assessing and considering the recommendations. We will wish to discuss the recommendations from this report with the Minister and build on the work we already have underway to shape a programme of transformation. <coughs> in addition, we have been working closely with the political parties on what a bespoke childcare offer for Northern Ireland should include. Significant work has been done to identify uh, high-level options, uh, informed by extensive stakeholder engagement, and early discussion, uh, further early discussion will take place with the Minister on the way ahead. So it's clear that we have many challenges and opportunities across the education sector. However, I believe that despite the challenges, there's great promise for positive transformation and progress. With the return of Ministers, we now have the opportunity to deliver a significant reform programme that will have a positive impact on the educational experiences and outcomes for our pupils and to ensure that every child and young person is happy, learning and succeeding. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Permanent Secretary. Um, and uh, I think it's it's quite apt that we, we had the, the NITC in because many of the issues you've raised, I think, were, were covered in, in, a, in a fair bit of detail in their <coughs> presentation and in, in the evidence session that, that, that followed. Um, and I think that the, some of the key challenges, um, the, the, the issues were, were, were definitely, uh, there, was, there was a lot of correlation there, but I think perhaps some of the, the emphases may, may have been, been slightly different, so we perhaps pick, pick up on that. Um, like I want to make sure we get give everybody the opportunity to, to, to ask uh, questions uh, in relation to your presentation, and I know that we're going to hear probably in a lot more detail as, 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 the, as the weeks uh, progress in terms of the specific areas of policy, and look, we are, we're looking forward to that, to that detailed engagement. I just wanted to ask just a, a two two really key questions for me in relation to to, to pay. Um, and the first would would be on the back of the briefing we just received, and then the second uh, is is on a different uh, different topic. So in terms of the briefing we'd received, one of the things that came through really clearly was that there was a very positive feeling about the the engagement and and, and the attempts now to, to to resolve the the the, the industrial dispute that's been ongoing. But that there was a real concern around some previous recommendations around uh, workload review um, and in terms of how to address that for teachers and a feeling that a lot of that has been paused for, for a very long period 
some of those are cost neutral is how it was it, it was it was described and not progressing so i just want to get a sense of of what sort of work is going on within the department to deal with some of those workload issues alongside the pay which we're, we're, we're very welcome as a committee that there, there is now it looks like there is resource to deal with that and the second question uh, is around non-teaching uh, staff and the support staff which which you, which you raised um, there, there is a lot of concern and I think probably every member here has been receiving contact from, from members of, of unions over the last few days who, who really do seem to be deeply concerned um, that, that they, they may not be in a position to, to be included in any, in any uh, pay negotiations and I'm conscious it's not a strict pay negotiation, it is a pay and grading review but we, I would certainly welcome a, a, as, as detailed an update as you can on, on where that sits and the likelihood of being able to deliver something in that regard. Um, if not just to get the business case uh, dealt with uh, at the Department of Finance level as a first as a first action, um, so I, I'll I'll keep my questions to those those two 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 specifics and then maybe other members will pick up um, so the the other areas of policy. Okay, Chair, thank you for those questions. I'll make a few. Yeah, uh, I'll make an initial response, and Ronnie can pick up on some of the the detail. Um, yes, there were there were a range of uh, work streams that were identified. Um, after the last um, um, pay agreement um, and there were a number of those uh, work streams where the department uh, was working with their partners including with the trade unions to look at a whole range of issues there were some nine work streams I think in total uh, and they included issues such as workload and a range of other a range of other issues uh, during COVID uh, that transformation had to be paused um, but we've, we've we've brought those to uh, a point um, where we think we can consider now how best uh, to take them forward. But the first priority, the first priority has to be to sort out the current pay dispute. Uh, it has to be to remove the threat of strike action, which is having has a, a very significant impact on children and young people, and particularly children with special educational needs. Um, and uh, also to remove the, the ongoing action short of strike, uh, which has been ongoing since for, for what, over, over a year. Uh, and if we go back a year or two before that, prior to COVID, there was a very extended period of action short of strike. So there's been a very significant period over the last eight to ten years of action short of strike, to the point where there are many uh, teachers who have entered the profession uh, in that period um, who would not have operated on what had previously been the accepted and normal teaching conditions. And when I go out to schools and I talk to school principals, they, uh, talk to their senior management teams, they are very concerned about the extent to which uh, there are significant numbers of, of, of relatively young, and increasingly less so as the time goes on, but teachers uh, in, the, in the profession who haven't actually um, been in a position where they have been taking forward their role in what, what would be the normal and accepted way. Uh, and the other point about action short of strike is that it has a corrosive impact on relationships within schools between senior management and between uh, senior management teachers uh, uh, and between te teachers themselves, it has an impact on children and young people, uh, on the activities that are available to them. It has an impact on the administrative arrangements for overseeing their work and tracking and monitoring their progress. It has an impact on the returns that are made to the department, uh, which may seem bureaucratic, but when they are the basis for assessing budgets, they are of, of extreme importance. Uh, to schools and to uh, ourselves. They also provide the in information that we need to know um, how schools are performing. And the other point, of course, is about action short of strike and the non-cooperation with inspection. We are the only part of these islands where um, it, 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 it is possible for teachers not to cooperate uh, with inspection, which means that for that extended period that I've talked about, we have not got the information that we would expect to get uh, from the inspectorate on what is actually happening uh, in our schools and what the issues are in our system and that is a very serious issue. Um, but those are the high level points I would make in response to that to Chair and Chair Ronnie can fill in some of the, some of the detail around, uh, around the other questions. I could just <coughs> come in very quickly in response okay. to that uh, just to say that you know I think it was it was very much the, the key theme of the briefing we've just had that, that that pay is absolutely central so I think I think there is agreement on that um, and I think there, there's a seems to be a collective view that, that bringing you know, an end to action short of strike is in everyone's interest. But I raise the issue of the workload review because 
what we don't want to see is is dealing with pay. Certainly in the short term, there's issues around rec- you know recurring budgets to to cover you know ongoing pay claims, but. To, to then see further industrial action down the line if we don't deal with some of those workload issues where there had obviously been an expectation a number of years ago that that was all in train and was going to progress. I, I think I just want them to be clear that you know it's it, it's to make sure that the, we, we don't just focus entirely on pay and assume that, that the job is then done in terms of industrial relations. And I think in fairness, Chair, we, we won't be doing that. I think we, we recognise that pay is the, the key issue and the urgent issue that needs to be dealt with in a, in a speedy way. Um, I think there are really positive relationships between the unions and management side, despite the challenges we have. Um, I think it is, it's a positive now that we have a, a remit within which to negotiate, and those negotiations have, have started. That's obviously sensitive, and I'll not go into detail on that. But in terms of the of the workload, as Mark indicated, there were nine reviews. I think eight of those have been complete. There's something in the region of 279 recommendations flowing from those. Um, I mean, certainly it, it would be wrong to suggest that nothing's been happening. I think there's been a lot of activity going on across management side, and we will be getting into discussions um, and negotiations with our trade union partners around those. Um, I think you indicated in your opening remarks some of them can be implemented at, at no cost or low cost. Other recommendations will obviously involve funding which we, we don't have over and above the what, what's on the pay remit, but we will certainly be getting into the detail of all of that with the unions and trying to negotiate a way forward. Um, but undoubtedly you're right in saying, you know, strike action, action short of strike, needs to be brought to an end um, and we need a long-term sustainable uh, pathway forward that we don't end up in a similar situation uh, again having come through all that we've come through. Non-teaching. In terms of the non-teaching staff, um, we are working still on the business case for that with um, our colleagues in DOF and the Education Authority. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a very significant uh, amount of money here in terms of implementing the pay and grading review. It is a complex business case, it's challenging, uh, but the Minister met with the uh, trade unions yesterday um, and gave them the commitment that we would push ahead to get the business case finalised as quickly as possible. He will then, and we will then need to uh, make a case for the funding for, for that, which we which we don't have currently um, and is not budgeted for it. Um, with, within our provision. Thank you for your, you know, your your update on that. I mean, I think I would just add to my initial comments. I think that it is it is essential um, that 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 is progressed. And I know that what happens beyond making a decision on the business case at Department of Finance level is is out of your hands at this stage. But I think to at least get to that point is absolutely critical. And whatever work the department needs to engage in with the Department of Finance, I would be urging you to, to, to do so. I think the level of frustration among the non-teaching unions is, is at an all-time high. I think they feel frustrated that <coughs> it has taken so long to get to this point. I think they felt that this was ready to go a number of years ago, um, and I think that they, they feel, even over the last year, that it's sat at departmental level for quite some time. So I think it is important to understand that, well, as far as I can, I can see it, if this is not resolved, we are looking at a protracted period of ongoing industrial uh, action, and, and I don't think the, the system can 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 cope with that. So I, I I know that you are well aware of these issues, but I think it is just really important to get that on the record today. That you know we we're in a, in a in a dangerous situation. I think in terms of 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 the system's ability to cope with 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 the, with an ongoing period of protracted industrial action um, from those. Me too. Just to maybe maybe just to respond to that quickly. Uh, we absolutely agree. Uh, the, the non, the non, I don't even like the term non-teaching staff. All their support staff are, are critically important uh, to schools, and we want to arrive at a fair res- resolution. I wouldn't accept the position that this has sat with the department for a long period of time. There's been an ongoing process between the EA and the unions, and then consequently with them providing the business case to us, and quite rightly, because of the significant amounts of money that, that are involved, the, the department has to scrutinise the business case, and in turn, the Department of Finance will scrutinise the assumptions that uh, the department is making, and that is only right and proper, and it's part of any business case process. There's always a toing and froing to check assumptions, to check data, and, and that is ongoing at the, at, at, at the moment, and there are a number of issues that still need to be flushed through. So it's not the case that 
a final perfect business case has arrived and the department has sat on it or that it, it has been put to the Department of Finance and they have said, this may be fine but we're not going to do it. There's extra work that needs to be done to clarify the business case, to clarify the figures, to test some of the assumptions before it can be in a position where it can be accepted. And this committee, and I'm sure other public reps, I wouldn't expect anything different given the amounts of, 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 of money that are involved in this. Absolutely. I think whatever the history of it, and there may be different versions of the history of how we were arrived it here, I think it, it's imperative that it now progresses as quickly as it, as it, as it possibly can. Uh, but no, thank you for that. I'm just going to bring the Deputy Chair in and then. Uh, hey, thanks, uh, and you're all very welcome. Just a couple of quick fire questions to start off with. You can feel free to give a yes or no answer. Uh, any plans to put the holiday food grant on a statutory basis? But I've already rather give yes or no answers, as you probably know from, mm. from previous appearances here. Um, the, the school holiday food grants um, were a, a really important uh, executive um, initiative funded centrally that was administered by the department on behalf of the executive because the administrative systems that were required to deliver those grants were available in the Education Authority because they play free school maids, so therefore the capacity was there. This is not an educational, a pure educational um, initiative. It, it, it is an anti-poverty initiative, and it was funded by the executive. Now, it was one of the hardest decisions I had to take uh, uh, to actually end that, and the reason it ended wasn't because of any doubt over the value of it or the importance of it. The money was not made available. The money that had previously been made available from the centre was not made available to, to the department. And we couldn't divert educational funding for what isn't uh, an educational initiative and what had previously been funded centrally. Had that money continued, the initiative would have continued. So my response would be, if the executive believes that this remains a priority, and if the executive provides the funding, we're absolutely happy in the short term to continue to administer it. In the longer term, I think it's something that we, need, that we need to be discussing with the department for communities to see where does this actually properly sit and how does it sit with things like an anti-poverty strategy. So that's a long way of saying yes if the money comes. Fair enough. <coughs> Fair enough. Uh, just in terms of the <coughs> review of the criteria of eligibility for free school meals and school uniform grants, when is that going to be completed? Well, there's been quite a lot of work done with um, uh, <coughs> the stakeholder groups uh, looking at what the range of options are. So that work is, is, is reasonably far advanced. But we'll have to um, discuss with the ministers of what the range would be to go out to consultation around that. Uh, the reality <coughs> is we didn't um, take that to the point of consultation uh, at a time with, with no ministers and with the budgets in such a severe state that there would be no point. Uh, but we, we will want to discuss with the Minister in, in, the, in the very near future because the, the, uh, the work is, 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 is pretty far advanced. Uh, we, have, we have a reasonably clear idea of what the options are and there's the opportunity there for consultation and then for a consideration as to what, as which, which of any of those options can, can be afforded. So okay. in, in the near future is the answer to that. Fair enough. I understand it's early days yet and I suppose, I mean, I'll get a similar answer about the, the school sports programme. Any plans to reintroduce it? The school sports program um, takes us into curriculum issues, and I think I think this this the, as part of the, um, the 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 funding pressures that that we were facing, um, which were very severe. Um, we had to look at all of our our funding and try and protect what we would regard as core core funding. Now, PE is a core part of the curriculum. It's something that's delivered by teachers uh, in the, in in the main. Um, that's that's their role and function. The, the, we did provide extra funding to a number of sports organisations to come in and provide additional support to teacher to deliver programmes, mm. and that's what you're referring to. Given the choices that we had to make, we weren't able to continue that funding. Uh, our view would remain that actually the key delivery of the curriculum is for teachers, and that we need to support teachers to be able to deliver the curriculum more effectively if there are some concerns or lack of confidence among teachers with their, their capacity to do that. It would then be up to schools to decide over and beyond that whether or not they wish to spend some of their funding on bringing in additional support. Now, if, if we, we get a very good settlement and, and there's the money available to, to uh, bring in this sports programme, we can consider that. But we'd have to set it aside what we see as the core responsibilities of teachers and whether that's a priority for us. Okay, fair enough. <coughs> fair enough. Um, workforce planning in the Irish medium sector, has there been any work done on that? Because you'll be, you'll be aware that there's a supply problem for teachers in the Irish medium sector. 
Yes, uh, there has. Pat, we've had, we're in close um, consultation and discussion with uh, CNG on these a whole range of issues in the Irish media because there are some very tricky issues in the Irish medium sector and the supply of teachers is one of them. Um, I mean, we have uh, maintained the, the places that are available in the initial teacher training. But part of the, There are a whole range of issues that come into play here in terms of um, teachers uh, initially taking up those places but then not subsequently staying within the sector, being trained and then maybe going abroad or going into the English medium sector. So there are a number of complex issues that we're trying to work through with CNG. We're very keen that we can find some resolution to it and we're open and, and we're working with CNG to try and find what are the solutions to this. It's a tricky, it's a tricky problem. It's not from any lack of effort on behalf of the department or any lack of willingness. It, it, it is one of those issues about supply, about attractions, and about the extent to which um, uh, uh, individuals come forward for that training and then stay within the sector. Or a final question. Just uh, it's an issue I've raised with you before, prior to the publishing of the uh, independent, independent review panel's report. Uh, I had flagged up to you the fact that having spoken to the chairperson, he had indicated that the panel didn't believe that educational underachievement here was any higher or any any higher than anywhere else uh, on these islands. Now he conceded uh, <coughs> at the launch of the report that we lag behind the South, but I think it's important to establish whether or not we do have higher rates of educational underachievement here than other places. And all the evidence suggests that we do. I mean, the, the, the recent uh, ERSI report, the comparative study of the education systems north and south, uh, suggested that we have far higher numbers of young people leaving school without qualifications and far fewer numbers of young people going on to third level education. Uh, and, uh, you know, previous reports have also flagged this up. And I think it's important because if we accept that there aren't higher rates of underachievement, then it affects how funding is delivered. However, if, if we accept the contrary, that there are higher levels, then that affects how funding is delivered also. So w what's your view on that? Well, I, I know you raised it with the the, the, the independent, uh, the chair of the independent panel, and obviously what the, the comments that, the, that they made are their comments. It's their assessment of the data. It's not our assessment of the data. Um, and and uh, I know he gave you a response uh, at that time. Our our our, our view in this panel is that, that we have significant problems of underachievement. And I'll, I'll ask Lindsay to come in just for some of the things we're doing around this. But our view is that we have very significant problems of underachievement. That there is a persistent gap between those who are on, on our measures on free school meals and not on free school meals. And we have a whole range of policies that are designed to try and close that gap as far as we can. Now, this is not an issue that's particular to Northern Ireland. This is an, a worldwide issue with the association between uh, uh, lower socioeconomic status or income and, and achievement. Um, but what we want to do is to try and close that gap as much as we can and try and mitigate those things that impact on that. We have a whole raft of policies that, that are there to try and do that. So I, don't th I would make the point that this is a key priority for us, that we recognise there is a significant and enduring uh, issue, and it's one also that has got worse, and has been exacerbated through COVID. Because those that have that have been impacted most by COVID are those who are from disadvantaged circumstances, and uh, uh, the, the 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 tentative information that we would have is that the positions got actually worse. Uh, and this is at a time where, because of budgetary constraints, we've had to stop some of the special initiatives that there were post-COVID, like Engage, because we didn't have the funding for it, Healthy Happy Minds. Um, uh, we haven't been able to put those measures in place, so uh, I think we would have a real concern about the fact that not only do we have that gap, that gap is widening, and that we need to take action, or we're going to lose a generation of children around this. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to. Yeah, so just in building on, on that, the, the comments that, that Mark has made, I think that the research and the evidence is very clear about the links between socio-economic disadvantage and educational attainment and educational disadvantage. And as Mark has said, this has been compounded, obviously, by a cost of living crisis and by the ongoing legacy of the pandemic. When we're out in schools visiting, we consistently hear that there are children who are coming to school 
not being ready to learn because of the range of barriers they're facing in their lives often coming from the home situation that they're in or the community and the disadvantage they're facing. So it is a significant priority for the department. You'll be aware that the first start um, program has been in operation due to the budgetary pressures. We haven't been able to put the resource to it that matched the ambition of the panel when they first set out that programme of work. But nevertheless, we have been delivering that programme at a much reduced scale within the resources that were available, including the rollout of digital devices um, to a range of young people in multiple deprived areas. We have also been looking at key aspects of that in terms of SEM and the early years SEM inclusion service and developing and enhancing that. So there's a range of acts actions being taken forward through that first start programme but we do recognise that the scale of the ambition that was led out in that programme um, did require significant sustained investment back to Mark's opening comments that is the investment that just hasn't been with us in terms of the education budget but it will be required to be able to address the issues that were raised and that we continue to feel are very important that they're tackled so there were key actions within that report around developing a reduced educational disadvantage program for example and we would be keen to develop proposals around that that's taking a locality based approach focusing in on areas of particular disadvantage and an educational disadvantage that will allow us an opportunity to really home in on the range of issues because let's be honest the response to this is <coughs> is not only an education response and this does require cross-departmental collaboration and pooling for resources to really affect the change because the reality for many children is they're facing barriers to their learning, barriers to engaging in education that are resulting from other factors in their lives. And so we really do need to wrap around these children um, through that cross-departmental approach. OK, thanks for that. No doubt we'll talk about it more in the future, but thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Aaron, you're looking to come in next. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, and I welcome the conversation starting with, about pay. Um, recently, I spoke with Unite the Union just about the role, especially our classroom assistants have, specifically uh, in our special schools. There's so much more than just academic support. They help with hygiene and health. Um, so it's great to see um, that conversation had here today. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one follows up uh, on Irish medium education. Um, and I had uh, last year uh, visited the Guild College Jodura in Dungiven. Um, and got a really good sort of comprehensive view of Irish medium education and it's hugely positive to see the growth um, but I also became aware of some of the challenges as well and um, so I I'm just wondering um, one issue I've become aware of is that there's a lack of fluent Irish speakers grading uh, the papers of Irish medium students so we have a situ situation whereby we have people who have English as their first language uh, marking um, it, the exams of Irish speaking students in subjects like history and music um, and we know that context can be lost um, through poorly translated papers. So I, I'm just curious, um, this is something I really would love to know more about, if it's something maybe you're aware of, and if so, what can be done to rectify it? Okay, well, it's, it's one of a number of issues that we have. I mentioned in response to Pat's question uh, in, in relation <coughs> to the Irish medium sector, which has to do with supply of people with the, with the right skills in the right areas to be able to deal with the issues. Um, maybe Lindsay, you want to pick, just maybe pick up a wee bit on, on that particular uh, issue? Yes, certainly. And Cara, as Mark has said, there's a, a range of issues facing the Irish medium sector um, that we have been engaging regularly with SIA um, mm. around in terms of both curriculum and examinations. <coughs> I think the particular issue you raise around examiners is, is part of a wider problem as well in terms of the ability to be able to attract examiners um, to examine and mark exams. So that's part of a wider challenge and, and a piece of work that we have ongoing with CA around that. But those issues are then compounded, as you rightly say, in terms of the Irish medium sector. Mm -hmm. So I have no answer to give you for today, but just to say that we are working closely with SIA and with the Irish medium team within the department mm -hmm. to develop a response to this. 
um, because there's also issues in terms of the resources. So we're trying to look at those in a more strategic way with the Irish medium sector mm -hmm. to bring forward some potential responses to it. No, and I welcome that because I was mindful um, there was one example of a student who uh, in Irish you know, was used, used to getting A's and B's and then went down to, I believe it was a C or D. So just I, I appreciate that something is ongoing um, to tackle that issue. And um, just uh, moving on then, um, I suppose I just have a question around, um, uh, you had answered actually my question around special educational needs, but this is with regards to <coughs> challenges outside of the classroom that our young people face. Um, and last year I met with uh, children who were carers and I heard about how their stories and their caring responsibilities in the home shaped um, and often negatively shaped their academic experience and achievement. Um, can I ask, does the department keep any statistics on how many uh, pupils in our education system are carers? Um, and is there any sort of ideas in how the department could uh, increase support for carers? I mean, one example that popped up from um, children who are carers themselves was if they're given an opportunity at the start of each school year to declare um, that they're a carer quietly, um, but also this could you know, uh, run on to maybe children uh, in the home could talk about what's going on by noting it down with a teacher on paper, um, maybe their uh, child of addiction for example, um, just to give teachers an understanding of what's going on when they're not in the classroom and maybe how it's shaping um, their <coughs> academic achievements. So uh, that's my final question, just if you have anything on that, that would be helpful. Okay, well, um, in relation to children who are carried with a, a recent initiative uh, that, that the department uh, engaged in um, with those who work with uh, children and young people in the in in the sector to deal with that very issue because I think part of the issue is I don't I don't think we have statistics and I need to I don't think we carry statistics of the numbers here occurred but the, the, one of the recommendations uh, uh, from that that uh, uh, initiative uh, was that it was important that schools make sure that they are aware when children come in. Uh, and when the pu pu pupils come in as to whether or not they have caring responsibilities so that they're therefore able to make staff aware should certain issues present, whether it's in terms of punctuality or whether it's in terms of homework done or whether it's in terms of just children being upset uh, or needing time off or whatever. The first thing is that school needs to be aware that they actually have caring responsibilities. Uh, and then I think there were, there were other uh, uh, aspects of the initiative that related to raising awareness among uh, uh, children and young people um, of the fact that children can be carers in the first place. Um, also looking at the extent to which where children are carers they might have the opportunity you know, to, to, to be made known to each other, to have the opportunity to share experiences, share the difficulties that they have, maybe share solutions or just or just find friendships and find find so support from their peers. So, so uh, there was a pack uh, that was pulled together and that was launched and I think it was about a month ago um, so we can get you details of that, uh, Cara. I can't remember all the precise details now, but there was a launch uh, associated with that, and there has been a campaign. And, and I know I, I wrote out to all school principals with the details uh, of it, encouraging them to take, to take those steps and, and signpost them to the materials that had been developed. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Nothing. Thank you. Um, and thanks again for, for coming along today. Um, I suppose to start out, um, I'm really glad to hear that the Minister has in these very, very early days recognised the childcare um, issue and, uh, of course, the strategy. Um, um, I suppose through engagement, um, through probably through the Executive Office in, in this last few months, um, I am aware that that's, there is a very small team within the Department working on that and there has been quite a lot in terms of the costed options and that um, pulled together. It's just, firstly, is there any form of commitment to put more resources towards that to try and expedite this and um, given just the urgency on it and also to see if is there a possibility of getting an update in that strategy I, I'm not sure through the chair if it's if it's not something that you can facilitate with us right now obviously is it something that we can maybe get as a committee and um, as a matter of urgency on those costed options and, and maybe where we are with that um, look it, it's it's well rehearsed the impact that affordable and quality childcare and has not only on, on the child but families, the economy and I also feel that it's a, a gender equality issue um, that we're dealing with as well um, and again appreciating that it's very <coughs> early days but I just would like to know that given this past few years and the impact of the cost of living crisis and what that has had on our childcare providers and, and we see it, the pressures that they're facing and there's more pressures coming down the road um, <coughs> to them. Um, is there any plans possibly for some sort of interim funding 
for for those guys um and also during covid um there was an excellent forum that was set up um for the ongoing stakeholder engagement um in in that uh, area and it was very effective. The feedback that I get from, from the sector is that it was very effective in identifying issues very immediately um, and that the department were able to then put um, measures in place for that. Is there any or has the minister given any indication of maybe bringing that back um, just for now and the, and the immediate issues that those guys are having? Well, look, th- thanks very much for that. I'm going to let Ronnie, because Ronnie's been working, working okay. in the next um, just pick up on the responses. Well, we, first of all, thank you for the acknowledgement of, of the work that's been going on. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is a very small team, and they've, they've done a huge amount of work uh, to get us to where we are now around the cost and options. We're now talking to the Minister about those, and, and you're aware from the Minister's statement of how he plans to take it forward. <coughs> you're, you're equally right to say... Uh, we are going to need more resource and we're trying to secure that resource um, because there is a huge amount of work here uh, that that needs to be done. Um, I mean, our priority at the moment is looking at affordability and sustainability, the two, the two issues that you, uh, you have touched on. Uh, and we are looking to see other interim things that we might be able to do now that we have a minister and executive in place. Um, and the minister will hope to bring forward proposals uh, to the executive around, uh, you know, around that development work. I'm back next week, and we are going to give you next week uh, a more detailed briefing um, around the childcare strategy and and where we where we are. If you're if you're happy enough to mm-hmm. to do that, but but just to give you that assurance um, that the minister being very clear with us in terms of the urgency and the need to drive forward and to build on the work that we have been. That we have been doing, so we're not we're not stop starting from a a, a a bad place. There's a lot of work been there, and 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 that's positive. In terms of the stakeholder engagement, we absolutely welcome uh, the stakeholder engagement. We do have that stakeholder forum. Um, I think it met the last the last time just before Christmas, um, and we do have plans to to have further meetings of that group as we as we develop because listening to the lived experiences um, that that are there are, are vital for us in developing what we're seeking to develop. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, and, and thank you very much for the update. Um, I suppose for me, a significant proportion of children and young people in Northern Ireland are experiencing mental health and obviously self-harm as well. You know, I would come um, at this committee, obviously as an MLA, but as a parent um, of a first year, and I see it more and more now, the quite serious implications of social media and self-harm and mental health within young people. So. Um, I have seen a number of methods of best practice um, through a lot of the schools in my area, but my question, I suppose, would be, will there be increased funding um, made available for schools to ensure they have this continual access to counsel and support, and of course, support for teachers, um, particularly in times of crisis for young people? I have another three questions, but I'll go through them quite fast. Um, Linking on to this as well, there is physical activity, um, which again helps to promote health and wellbeing. So the last committee I noticed had raised the inconsistency about physical education and outdoor exercise and the fact that the two hours minimum requirement wasn't being met. So from the department, have they addressed this or is there any action um, they will take to go forward? Um, In terms of special educational needs, I think we could probably spend a week on that. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions um, I would have is that there was a NI audit office report done. I think it was maybe back in 2020. So has any of the recommendations from that report been implemented um, recently, or at least from that report was issued? And if so, obviously, what would they be? Um, The childcare strategy... um, Cathy stole my question there, but I think it's absolutely key. Um, and I welcome the Minister being so upfront um, and being putting basically resources and action towards this. I think this is absolutely key that we move this forward as soon as possible. And I welcome that there'll be an update for the committee next week. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Lindsay's going to pick up on those questions, Cheryl. Yeah, certainly. So, in terms of your first one around emotional health and wellbeing, Cheryl totally agree when we go out to visit schools this is one of the most significant issues that that comes up we've also done a lot of direct engagement with young people themselves 
and they've pointed to what, what they would see as a as a pandemic in terms of emotional mm-hmm. health and well-being issues um, the pressures of social media etc uh, as you've mentioned so we're very very <coughs> conscious of, of these these pressures on our young people um, you'll be aware of the jointly funded emotional health and well-being framework um, that we fund along with our colleagues in the Department of Health and that encapsulates a range of supports for schools but we accept a lot of those are pilots and they're, they're nowhere near getting near all of the need. Um, obviously, you'll also be aware that the Healthy Happy Minds pilot has been evaluated. Our minister's considering the findings of, the, of that evaluation in terms of shaping a future response. In terms of post-primary counselling <coughs> support, that support remains in place. Um, the existing contract is up until August of this year, so EA are currently going through the process of putting out, uh, that out to tender. But none of that is actually negating the need for us to do further work around this. So I would mentioned that we have been engaging specifically with young people. You might have seen recently uh, the logo that young people designed around the emotional health and wellbeing framework and, and the youth voice that played into that. Um, and we're working with young people and with our stakeholder group just in terms of what more can be done in terms of the levers that are open to us. So one of the issues that has been raised with us is how our curriculum, for example, is playing into emotional health and well-being. So there are many issues that we need to look at, including primary school counselling, the further extension of post-primary counselling, but also fundamentally, how do we build the emotional health and well-being and resilience of our children and young people right from the earliest age right through all stages <coughs> of school and it's something that we're keen to continue to engage with stakeholders the mental health commissioner and with young people themselves uh, around in terms of your second point about the the PE um, and the ETI evaluation which raised a number of issues um, including the fact that a vast majority of schools weren't providing um, that those two hours and it made a range of recommendations so in response our curriculum team has established task and finish group within the department to bring together the various aspects of the department that play into this space because the recommendations that were made were around the physical capacity of many schools to be able to offer around the confidence capability of teachers so there were issues around teacher professional learning and indeed in terms of the curriculum content itself so that task and finish group is ongoing and I'll be able to provide a further update and more detailed update I'm here I think in two weeks time so it could go into more detail around the the specific (coughs) work streams around that. In terms of your your third point, and you're right, we we could spend (laughs) a a whole day and more around special educational needs. And again, we'll be able to get into much more detail when I'm back in in two weeks' time. But just to pick up on your specific question, um, yes, the Northern Ireland Audit Office produced a report with a range of recommendations. (coughs) Uh, Since that, there have been other scrutiny reports with other recommendations. Um, You may be aware that the department recently initiated an end-to-end review of special educational needs, which, despite his name, is not another review of the issues. What it's seeking to do is bring a shape to uh, the response, the department's response to what are now more than 200 recommendations around special educational needs. Many of those have been responded to in terms of the various work streams being picked up through the end-to-end review. But that analysis is actually (coughs) summarising all of those recommendations. And that is what has taken us to the the place where Mark brought us at the beginning. Right support, right time, Mm. right people, right place. Um, So the Minister will seek to bring forward a more detailed implementation plan. Mm. Uh, following on from our analysis through the end-to-end review, informed by the feedback from that um, and setting out actually a transformation plan in terms of the range of things that need to be done to both respond to the recommendations but importantly to transform services for children. I no, appreciate that and I welcome um, all your updates there. They're very positive and it's great to see that the department is taking such a proactive view on these and moving it forward in the right way. So I look forward, I think, to the next few weeks. <laughs> we'll be busy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. And yes, it is welcome. We're getting further in-depth uh, updates uh, are, are scheduled on some of those areas. So we, look, we do look forward to that. Danny, I'll bring you in. Thank you, Chair. Ah, thank you. Um, I suppose just following on from what Cheryl was saying there about special educational needs, um, I suppose for me, I know there's a lot of work ongoing, but it's just for in a very short period of time, we're going to be back at placements for, for children. And 
I can only go by my constituency office, but the challenges from the last couple of years haven't even been um, worked out. And it's about reducing those barriers um, for, for, for children in the school. Um, many children are now put in the mainstream schools who should be in special schools, but there's no place. And I suppose it comes down to capacity. Then what's happening is children are faced with reduced timetables, um, which is, we'll all accept that's just unacceptable. And I suppose my question for it is what, <coughs> what can happen in the here and now for, for to leave some of the concerns that, that, that the families are going to be having when they're applying um, in the next couple of, couple of months so that we don't have a repeat of how bad it was last year because, as I say, we're still working through that there. Thank you, Danny, for your, for your question. And, and yes, since uh, 2020, I think the, the numbers of children with statements of special educational needs and requiring placements have been rising and, and rising rapidly. Uh, I think what we saw last year was a huge increase in those numbers, um, but also a huge increase in the complexity of the needs um, that the children were displaying, um, and a particular hike in the numbers um, in the early years, um, which may have pointed to some of the impact of the pandemic uh, in terms of those early childhood um, developmental milestones that perhaps weren't being met um, the approach um, uh, where health visiting wasn't happening during that time, etc., and the impacts of all of that on, on the development of, of children. Um, when we look at our census data within the department, um, we're forecasting that the number of children with statements of SEN is due to increase year on year <coughs> up until 2032. Um, and so we're looking at a changing profile of pupil population. And the challenge for us is actually how we pivot to meet the needs of that changing pupil profile. So what happened last year was this huge increase and then the challenge around finding placements for those children. In recognition of that and in preparation, um, we have been leading a strategic group around SEM placements that has been meeting since October, November time of last year, uh, where previously placements would have just been planned really in the months preceding. We have kept that ongoing to try and get ahead of the numbers, to try and get ahead of the data. That being said, <coughs> the numbers that are coming through already and that the EA are predicting are still looking particularly challenging. Um, I think we put in something around 94, 95 specialist provisions in mainstream for last year. It's looking like we'll need an additional 70 or so of those for this year. So we are working intensively with the Education Authority um, to understand the data, what it's telling us, to try and identify the areas of geographic pressure. Uh, but investment will be required and re required urgently in terms of the capital requirements to put the specialist provisions in. But this is not just a matter of physical space. Uh, if we go right back to right support, right time, right people, right place, we need to ensure that schools are supported to be able to meet the needs of these children. And so again, investment will be required around teacher professional learning and ensuring <coughs> the appropriate resourcing for those specialist provisions in mainstream as well. So there's no doubt there's a challenge around the numbers, but the minister has given his commitment. He's prioritising this. Um, this is a matter of significant priority, both within the department and within the education authority. But we really need to <coughs> urgently get ahead of the numbers and to understand the data. In longer term planning terms as well, we also need to work more closely with health around what data we can get at an earlier stage to be able to make some longer term projections and modelling to help us. If we know numbers are going to increase until 2032, we need to get under the numbers to understand the profile of that need and how our system can best pivot to meet the needs of the children. Yeah, that was actually something I just want to ask about that cooperation with the health department as well as early intervention is going to be key to all of this going forward. Um, just a wee quick one for going to youth provisions, if you don't mind. Um, senior saying the extra seven, was it seven, did you say? That's, uh, that's uh, at this offering, point estimated. Do you know how many nurseries will be lost to that? There, because that was one a problem as well when, when schools were taking on like the satellites to that. Nurseries were 
basically closed down. So <coughs> would that be the same? Well, we're, no, we're working very closely with the EA at the minute to analyse that data yeah. and w- what stages it's at. Is it at early years? Is it a transition into year nine? So we're just looking at all of that at, at the minute, Danny. But I don't think we'd want to be in a position again where we're prioritising yeah. one set of children over another. Um, but difficult judgments have to be made at times because w- w- we want to make sure children are placed and are placed in an appropriate place with the right supports. I appreciate that. Indeed. And I'm going to jump on to a different area. And it's, um, it's really just the ask, is it possible, I, I suppose, for the department to, to review how funding model is in place for the community and voluntary sector within within our youth clubs because it was it probably now get my dates right but 18 months ago when we seen that change within the 136,000 to run the youth club dropping to 96 the specification change and I suppose the most alarming thing for me as an elected um, representative was how the EA was not only their funder, their collaborator, their assessor, their monitor of, of the voluntary sector I don't think it's, it's, it's fair and then you know, I see the good work that the community and voluntary sector do. I know how great the youth workers are within the statutory sector as well, don't get me wrong. It's just that burden then was just stretched. That, that, that If I look at West Belfast, we lost an out, outreach team. Um, that the pilot, like the evidence was there, how great work <coughs> that they had done. Taking that away, it'll be a lot longer down the line to see the implications of losing that, that, that great outreach detached team because that was probably stopping young people from offending, maybe going through the judicial, judicial system, and, and how much that cost going down the line. So again, I think there's a body of work for cooperation around all departments when it comes to youth services as well. But it is just that we review of, of the specifications, because we actually had a correspondence in today from from Somalgis, was it? It was Somalgis, but it could have been any youth club, um, the, the community of Aldi sector across the board because of the, what they're facing now with that reduction, because it's basically moving them down from the full time hours, the part time, and then the additional pressures on the youth leaders as admin to go and find the additional funding uh, and work through the end specifications. So it's just it's just that we we review because when the end specifications come out as well, the lags and the rags they were also chaired by the EA as well. And I know that's changed, but that was another wee problem that was, was definitely came from from the end specifications when they were released. But I do I do believe it would be good if the department could have a wee review of of how that's carried out going forward. Thank you, Danny. And and yes, the, you, you've raised a number of issues there <coughs> around youth services that, that we're very well aware of. Um, the department has, has become very closely involved um, over the last year to 18 months, um, following on from the issues th- that emerged in terms of, of the funding model. Um, as a result of that, we have initiated a review of the policy framework around youth provision priorities for youth um, had been in place for some time um, and it was clear there were differing interpretations amongst the youth sector in terms of the implementation of that so um, the department has started work uh, around that that uh, review of the policy. Aligned to that, the EA are also um, looking at the issues that have been raised around the voluntary from the voluntary and community sector uh, specifically. Um, aligned to the review of the policy will be the need to review the funding delivery model. It's important that any funding delivery model closely aligns to the policy intent set out in the policy document, and so it's really important that anything that's set out in the policy is delivered through an effective delivery model. So that will be reviewed. Now you've mentioned the rags and the lags. Um, There were a number of shorter term actions in the interim before there's a a full review of the funding delivery model that could be implemented to (coughs) improve relationships across the sector. Um, That has included looking at the membership and the chair, etc., of the regional advisory groups, the local advisory groups. I know um, we're also looking at the methodology around how need is assessed and how that plays into then funding decisions. So there are a range of issues to be looked at, uh, and they will be looked at in terms of a review of that funding delivery model that must be aligned um, to the 
to the policy. And um, you'd mentioned also the role of other departments, uh, and you're quite right. Youth services um, can often be funded from a range of departments, and I think departments then in turn benefit um, from the amazing work that, that youth workers actually do. Um, those benefits are clear in terms of the economy, education, justice, community. Um, so in light of that, um, we have pulled together a cross-departmental uh, group around youth work. Um, it has met once, I chair that, with senior officials from other departments. And again, we want to use that to very much inform our policy review and to also get a sense and stock take of what's happening across departments in terms of youth services. So we are making those connections at a cross-departmental level. Thank you. And before I bring David in, I think I just there's quite a number of questions that focused on, on special educational needs, quite specifically, and I know that, that you'll be presenting on that in, in a couple of weeks. I don't think you'll get any issue with this committee in terms of supporting transformation work and early intervention and early identification of needs, but I think it is really important to just get it very clearly on the record that there is a lot of anxiety out there among parents who are looking at places in those key transition years coming up uh, in September. And I think particularly <coughs> given what happened with the preschool uh, issue last time around, and Danny's absolutely right, I mean, anyone in a constituency office, you know, the, the volume of, of, of queries coming through was, was substantial. So I think we would just really want to impress as a committee on how vital it is that, that we, we, we get appropriate places provided for, 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 for those children. I know that there was a, a huge amount of work done to get children into placements, but there is definitely a question mark whether all those places were appropriate or appropriately, resor appropriately resourced or the schools were appropriately equipped to meet their needs. So it's really just to emphasise the long-term transformation and the work on that is so welcome. Um, I would also highlight that the Northern Ireland Teaching Council, some of the messaging coming through from them was a real concern around some of those specialist provisions in mainstream not being properly supported to meet the children's needs um, and schools not feeling equipped to, uh, to do that. So it's really just to get that on the record from the committee that the, the, the short term pressures, and I know you're aware of it, and we, we know that the amount of work that's going in, but uh, that there's a huge amount of anxiety out there and I don't <coughs> any of us want to see a repeat of, of what we had last, last year. I just wanted to, to put that on the record. David, I'll bring you in. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks very much for um, your, your presentation. Um, could, I, I mean, I would just say that um, it's great to hear uh, such agreement around the table around some of these priorities and what this committee wants to see. And, but I'm hearing very clearly in response to that, that you know the, the resourcing needs to match that. You know that uh, you know these ambitions without resourcing are just a wish list, uh, and and many of them undeliverable on that basis unless there is uh, that resourcing. And I think back to last year when I met with the the NIO, and as part of trying to get us back to this place, they were very much selling the um, land that, of milk and honey that could be provided if only we would come back here, um, the transformation of health, the transformation of our education service, and it's important, that that's, that's why we had argued for that genuine needs-based funding for Northern Ireland, and I think that's important for you and your priorities, uh, as well as, as for the other departments. So I, ho I hope the British government will <coughs> take that on board, but I, I also hope that the, the ambition around this table for the delivery of those uh, departmental and ministerial priorities is matched by um, the voices from those parties around the executive table when it comes to prioritising the education and those, the, the future of our children there as well in terms of what the finance minister and the executive can provide in, in that. Um, just uh, a couple of issues to move on to. The, um, just uh, if we can get an update or a comment upon what the department is seeking to do around the affordability of school uniforms uh, for parents. And, and some of those barriers that um, those who are from less well-off uh, backgrounds can face in terms of um, pr providing a, a good education to their to their uh, children, but also to make sure that their children don't feel set apart from the rest of, of the school in that regard. And secondly, uh, uh, on school transport, um, I, I've been aware of, not just in terms of my um, position as an MLA now, but also working um, in the background previously of a number of cases where the the policies around the provision of um, school transport to those for those who require it um, is very very rigid um, and at times completely lacking 
in any sense of uh, common sense or compassion or understanding or empathy with the family that is requiring it to the extent where I recall a case where um, the child was deemed to be in need of school transport and down to the policy that we'll all be aware of and dealt with in the past, I'm sure, of it needing to be the closest school to have that transport provided. Um, they were basically arguing that the, the, the child would have to move school um, over, over a distance of around 20 to 30 metres. Um, and it blew my mind the level to which um, we were having an argument around that level of, of distance when the disruption to that child, if they had followed through in order to facilitate the policy, would have been very, very significant. And yet the cost, there would be almost, uh, I would imagine, uh, no cost difference in terms of a, a journey uh, provided to that school than the other school. Um, and I just wondered if there is, is any intention on the department's part to look into that and try to, I understand that sometimes policies do need uh, on, on the legal standing some, um, it ha they have to be rigid to some degree, but is there any, any intention to look and review and bring an element of common sense to, to that? Okay. Thanks very much, <coughs> David. I'll pick up uh, those questions. In, in respect of school uniforms, we have been taking forward uh, uh, a review uh, within the, the department, uh, reviewing what happened or what, what was taken forward in England, which has had very mixed results. Um, looking at what's happening in Scotland, and in fact, we have uh, got agreement from a Scottish academic to help us uh, with with that review and to bring the experience from Scotland uh, uh, to play into that. So, we have uh, we, we we have gone out and consulted with a whole range of schools and and developed some outline proposals. I should say that this always appears to be a very simple um, issue to deal with. But is one that actually gets very complicated very quickly. Um, we are very much aware of the fact that um, it can be a barrier to children even even uh, applying to schools. It can be uh, uh, an issue that can put families into debt. It's one that causes great anxiety to a whole range of families, uh, and therefore it's something of 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 importance. And and, and the minister is. Uh, 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 keen to see the proposal that we will have and to see what can be done uh, around this. And some of the uh, the issues that we know that might that might help is the extent to which uh, all items of uniform have to be branded. Is that really necessary? Do, uh, it, do, 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 does there have to be um, single suppliers? Can there be competition? Why can there not uh, be uh, accommodation for uh, whether well, it's polo tops or, 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 or jogging bombs ever bought from the local supermarket, why does it have to be from a particular supplier? All those kinds of things are things that we need uh, uh, to look at. Um, the, it's often suggested just put a cap on costs. Putting a cap on costs takes you into all sorts of issues about interfering in, in, in the private sector, interfering with the right to trade, etc., etc., etc. It's actually quite complex, plus it's something you need to keep on our perpetual review. Um, so we need, we need to find a way through these processes. They are complex, but I think there are things that we can do. The other point I would make is that uh, uniform policy is, is a matter for boards of governors. Uh, it's their responsibility. Boards of governors can decide to remove all of these barriers if they choose to do, to do so. Um, and the guidance from the department, and I uh, actually wrote out last year uh, on this to reinforce this, was that um, School, school governors should exercise their discretion in determining what are deemed to be essential items of uniform and also in how they actually, um, if you use the term police or, or uh, uh, oversee the extent to which children are conforming to uniform policy uh, and made the point that children should not in, in any sense be excluded from education or deprived of their education as a consequence of an inability to pay for a school uniform. Uh, we made those points. That is all down to the policy of boards of governors, and it's open to boards of governors to make all of those decisions already. Now we know that the reality is that um, those decisions aren't being taken. Uh, uh, they are in some schools. Some schools will do that. Uh, other schools aren't, and that's where the, uh, the the pressures come around this. So we hope to have uh, a discussion with the minister in the near future. There's some further work we need to do just to refine the proposals. And at that point, I would hope that we'd be able to come forward with uh, some some uh, proposals to try and start to deal with this issue. But I would just caution that 
it's something that appears straightforward on the surface, but when you get into it, it's actually slightly more complex, but it's, it's important that actions taken. In respect to school transport, uh, some years ago I was responsible for school transport. I suppose I'm still responsible for it, but I was specifically in that, in that sector. And I used to wonder, well, what goes on in school transport? It can't be that complicated, can it? School transport, I think, generates possibly more judicial reviews than any other aspect of educational policy. As you say, uh, the, the rules are complex. Complex. Um, they 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 have a, uh, arisen because of the the, the complexity of um, the other policies that school transport is there to support. I mean, ultimately, school transport is there to support parental preference, so that where uh, a, a parent expresses a preference and that preference is met for a child to get to a school, if they're beyond the walking distance, then that that is uh, the child is able to uh, uh, access the school so that's really what the basis of, of the transport's about unfortunately where you have um situations where eligibility has to be very clearly determined you do get into these these very hard edges uh where a matter of meters or even less than that at times can determine whether someone actually falls within the line and eligibility for for um transport and not, and you can get what appears to be a ridiculous situation. I don't know the detail of what you, you describe, but it can sound ridiculous. However, the other point is, a policy can become, that's based on those kind of criteria, hard criteria, can become impossible to implement if you don't have those hard criteria. Now, having said all of that, the policy does contain elements of discretion to try and deal with particular circumstances that can emerge to try and avoid the sort of absurdities that you were describing. Um, and that discretion is there to be exercised by, by the EA in response to particular circumstances and there's, a, there's an opportunity for people to appeal uh, to, to that and to set out what those circumstances are. But the other point there is that even though you have discretion, that in itself can be JR'd because what you get into is the consistent exercise of discretion. Um, so if you have discretion, you must exercise it. But when you exercise it in one case, on a similar case of emergency, you must exercise it in, in the right way there, otherwise you're open to JR. So even having that discretion doesn't get you away from the sort of problems there are. You still have to manage that. But um, so are there things that we could do? Um, I'm sure there are things that we could do. And I think the first thing would be to try and see the extent to which we can be more, more compassionate as far as we can and trying to avoid some of the more absurd types of, extra, of, of, of decisions that are taken, allowing some flexibility there, while at the same time guarding ourselves against um, a whole series of judicial reviews which are very costly uh, and very expensive. And the other point I would make is I think uh, the expenditure on transports in the region of, I think is about 110 million a year. It's, 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 there's, there's a lot of money involved in it. It is, it is uh, expensive. Um, and and we do need to manage that budget effectively and the rules and the eligibility are there to make sure that those that um, the Assembly have determined should get the uh, support get the support. So it can create those problems but that is the issue around eligibility I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, well, you'll be relieved to know that uh, you're, 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 you're off the hook for now, so uh, no th thank you all for, for your time and, and for attending committee, and as I say, we, we really do look forward to, to uh, scrutinising uh, all of those policy areas in, in a lot more detail in the weeks to come. So, thank, thank you, Chair. just moves us on to item 10 of the agenda which is forward work program and it, we've had two really really lengthy briefings and, and question and answer sessions there but i think um for for give, given uh the, the significance of both of them it was important we gave it time but uh i i promise to uh, to try and be uh, and maybe a, a bit more rapid in the chair and when the weeks to come so apologies uh, for, for keeping everybody later this evening um we do need to have a quick look at forward work program so uh, clark has put together um a draft <coughs> forward work program for everybody which i hope you've had a chance to look at um, so I think if we just if we very quickly take a look at the the, the next uh, two or three weeks ahead, just to, to make sure we're we're all in agreement with, with what's been laid out. 
So for a week commencing the 26th, um, we have a departmental uh, briefing on uh, budget and early years. Um, so I know that that was raised today as something members are interested in. So hopefully that um, that we, we will all be in agreement on that. And then we had agreed at previous week employers for childcare to come in. Um, we also have a potential of a briefing from RAISE. Um, so I think uh, to maybe keep that as a on a one maybe one focus policy area to help uh, you know keep keep the meeting on schedule would, would would be helpful I think I think the researcher has been planning to address four four within, in a session within um, a session okay within uh, okay hour. and um, you think that's doable in the in the R uh, yeah hope so okay hope, yes how so. do members feel about that as a as a, as a plan for for that week okay yeah. um and then for the 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 week following that um. As was alluded to, we have the uh, department coming in around uh, education policy and children's services, and I think that will have a very specific focus on SEN, and I think it's very clear the committee wants to, to focus on that, so I think um, we're, we'll, we'll all be in agreement on that. In terms of a, a hearing from uh, maybe from the wider sector, um, have the Children's Law Centre been confirmed potentially as a... No, so you'll see that I've tried to, where we've got the departmental witnesses in, depending on what... Um, business areas they're representing I've tried to put in a relevant bit of induction on a relevant stakeholder but you know it's up to members to mm. give me feedback about which um, stakeholder in each case the children's commissioner hasn't been in touch but that's a particular that person has a particular statutory role in respect of this committee and um, so it would be good to hear from them um, and the children's <coughs> law centre would tell you all about Zen and what the you know rights expectations should be for that so they would line up nicely for Lindsay's session, for instance. I would certainly be happy to have the Children's Law Centre in to help us understand the legal and rights framework for that, to, to set up that session. And if there is capacity for the Children's Commissioner to attend, then that, that, would, that would also be helpful. What's the other talking about that? The week commencing the 4th. Uh, 4th. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm also conscious it would be good to hear from parents impacted by SEN. So I know the SEN Reform NIA group would, would, would or have been very active in this space, um, perhaps in an informal <coughs> stakeholder briefing, perhaps. Okay, but yeah. um, uh, that's something, if members are in agreement, I think it would be good to, to make sure that parental voice is heard as well. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so we've confirmed the Royal School of Speech and Language Therapists for Tuesday morning. And I think Josh has already maybe sent out the... Um, meeting request mm -hmm. to you all for that um, for the following Tuesday did you want to try to have the non-teaching unions I know Unite have been in touch yeah. but the paper's not in your paper tonight in your pack until next week I would have no objection to that if members are in agreement to, to get the non-teaching unions in for that session yeah for the Tuesday yeah. morning okay, okay. Um, and you'll see I've tried I tried to rejig the uh, mm. forward work plan so it was a bit more legible um, those where I've put like legislation written update, it would be maybe complimentary to have to receive those um, on that same day. So that's why I've marked them in there. But I've discussed that with the Dallow as well. And then our new um, RSE mini inquiry, we can yeah. put that in the orange column there under other committee business and start to line up dates for you. On that. Absolutely, that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, the only other thing really, if without maybe looking too far ahead, is I think we do just need to, to address when we would like to invite the Minister to attend. I, I mean, my my sense would be that by, by the week commencing the 11th of March, we might wait well be ready to hear from the Minister, um, but, but happy to take members' views on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, I agree with you. I, I don't think it's a good idea to get them in too soon, because you're just <coughs> going to get the answer that we haven't yeah. completed work around that issue or whatever. So. Uh, I would prefer that leave it for a while, then we can ask him about you know his proposed legislation, his priorities, and so on for the time ahead. Okay. So um, on on that basis, would we be suggesting that perhaps as per the the draft forward work plan that that having the department in on the week commencing the eleventh around infrastructure capital issues, and then perhaps the following week, is that is that the sort of time scale that the members would be content with? Yeah. Yeah, and then we could move on to the EA after the recess. And then, and then I think to have the opportunity yeah. to bring the EA in for that overview briefing would be would yeah. be really helpful. Yeah. Uh, sorry, when, when did you say about the EA? Um, so yeah, but one wants maybe aim for the minister week commence in the 18th, followed by the EA in the following week. The then okay, yeah. so there's two weeks of recess. We've put that in now. Yeah. Um, so it might yeah. be after recess yeah. for EA. Is that okay? Yeah. When does the recess start? Um, early, yeah, I think yeah, is it Easter's early? Uh, 25th of March, certain, 
No, that's not the start of it. That's an effective bit. Uh, have you got it handy? No, Neil? Week commence on the 25th and week commence on the first or the two weeks of recess. And perhaps maybe next next week, if we're, we're not so tight on time, we can maybe uh, start to iron out some more of those informal stakeholder uh, engagement sessions as well for the committee. Yeah, yeah. But do give me feedback if you think you're getting too much or too little or not the right stuff. You know, just let us know. And we'll sort of there's know. there's no meeting then on the 27th, is there not? No. We're in recess March 27th. Yes, yeah. that's okay. right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, so have we got agreement on the, 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 the forward work plan for those next few weeks? Thank you. Um, and you just wait because, yes, mentioned earlier, mentioned earlier on, so because we had the presentation, maybe it'd be a good idea for Youth Worker Lands to come in as well, just before in the round the EA coming in. If we were looking, because I think there would be space for another, a stay, another mm -hmm. stakeholder briefing there yeah. uh, that's not filled, and the Youth Worker Alliance feels like a good fit there. So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm certainly happy if members are in agreement. Yeah. Um, was it anywhere in particular? What, when we're getting EA in? Is that Donnie? Am I hearing that, that right? Okay. Yeah. 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 We try and get them in just before EA. Yeah. 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 I, think, I think it's Brilliant. it's really okay. good to, to have heard from a relevant stakeholder when you've got yeah. the right yeah. agency to question them in front of you. I would agree. Okay. Super. Thank you. So then, just item eleven is any other business? No, that's fine. Uh, and item 12, date, time and place of next meeting. Um, so that is next Wednesday, 28th of February, room 29 at 2 p.m. Thank you, Thank members. You. Thank you. That's very much appreciated. Thank you.